Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's stories, I just wanted to let you know that if you want to get stories um, a day, maybe two days in advance, you can uh, become a member of the channel or become a patron. Either way, you're supporting me and you're getting content a day or two days in advance. Also, I would like to point you towards the Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis. Basically, it's what I do over here. It's just the stories from the channel, but it's only audio. So if you listen to me to fall asleep, I highly suggest using Anchor or Spotify or iTunes, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find your podcast, you can find the Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis. It's all audio, so you don't have to run up your data or keep your phone on all night and run your battery low. It's really, really awesome, and it's another great way to support the channel. So if any of those things sound interesting to you, they will be in the description below. Check them out. Support the channel. Thanks a ton, everyone. Let's get into tonight's stories, because they are doozies. I'd work through the evening without so much as a glance at the clock. My home office, once cluttered from the move, had finally taken on the texture of a real working space. The comfort and focus made it easy to buckle down and work the daylight away without distraction. This was maybe the third twilight I'd managed to completely miss. From my protective nook of lamplight, embedded in the darkness like a dim gem on black, I scanned the room with my eyes, and the house with my ears. My new house, although open and relaxing under the sun, seemed to take on a tone of sinister silence once shrouded in the fathomless darkness unique to starless skies. I hated the constant cloudy weather, used to the city glow and concrete warm clear skies as I was, and I hated having to creep into the impenetrable blackness to turn on the lights. Twice before, I'd worked through sunset oblivious. Twice before, I'd endured this ritual, heart pounding, hands blindly feeling across as yet unfamiliar walls. This third time, I hesitated. I sat and listened to the silence echoing through unseen rooms. Wishing the house had constant rumbling breath like that of the apartment building I moved from. The rickety old central air system had been an annoyance at the time, but I'd have much preferred it to the countryside's insufferable stillness. As I balanced on the edge of my seat, straining the limits of my hearing, the unrelenting abnets of stimulation actually approached painful. And that was when my cell phone rang, scaring the shit out of me. Laughing with relief, face surely burning red, I picked it up from the table. I'd been silly, stupid, even. I'd filled myself with fear because I'd wanted to be afraid. An indulgence of childhood long past. Shaking my head, I reminded myself that there was nothing to fear, a fact which I still found disappointing. Sometimes, and recently more than ever, I wished there really was something supernatural. Anything supernatural. Hello? My ear registered a few random noises that I took to be the caller preparing to answer. I waited, but no words came. Hello? The same purposeless sounds continued. Confused, I looked at my phone. The number was unfamiliar. Still, I waited, intent on giving the caller a moment to realize they'd called somebody. I'd had a coworker once whose phone accidentally reprompted the last dialed call, and I was not looking forward to repeated interruptions. The good old butt dial, I said loudly, hoping the caller would suddenly have spoken words emanating from their pants. Maybe I was embarrassing someone on a blind date. That would be great. Hello? Nothing but spotty, scratching noises. I hung up. 
Placing the phone back on the desk, I swiveled in my chair, facing the task at hand again. The light from my little sphere of lamplight quickly turned into gloom as it traveled across the carpet, fading to sheer black by the time it reached the hallway. I allowed myself the brief, inexplicable notion that someone could, given the right position, be standing there in the darkness watching me. And I would have no idea. I jumped as the phone rang again. Christ. I picked it up and calmed my racing heart with self-directed sarcasm. You cannot be serious. Come on, it's just a misdial. My voice nearly reached the level of a shout this time. Hello? Hello? The sounds were a little different this time. More like a constant pattern of subtle crunches punctuated by the sound of fabric moving right against the other phone. It occurred to me that the caller might be walking somewhere on the season's freshly fallen leaves. Yeah, that was the noise. I knew now. The noises paused and muffled speech filtered through. The unidentifiable words were directed, so the caller was with someone. The same voice spoke again, there was a pause, and then the sound of fabric moving again and a grunt of exertion. The circle of darkness around me suddenly plunged shut with a nearly physical sensation of force. Stunned, I listened to the subtle whir of my computer die down into silence, leaving me with nothing but the startlingly loud sound of my own terrified breathing. It wasn't hard to make the leap. I just heard someone cut the power to my house. My mind raced with possibilities as I sat there in total darkness, struggling to quiet my breathing. I felt as if the unknown enemy could hear the air rasping in my throat even now. Keeping the phone to my ear, I used my free hand to feel my way across the carpet, heading for the window behind where I normally sat. I reached the wall even as I realized my mistake. Wait, no, not that one. The window facing the utilities box in the backyard would be... in the room at the other end of the hall. Muttered words drifted through the phone, followed by the unmistakable sound of plastic wires scraping against old metal. Wherever they were, they were still at the box, tinkering around, ensuring my home security system was off. I stared up at the place where I thought my desk might be. I'd been just about to get up and turn on all the lights in the house, if I had, they'd have known I was home. Did they believe me to be absent? Did they even care? If they found me mid-robbery... Stealing my trembling insides, I felt my way across the carpet, heading for the cooler air from the hallway. I could still feel that potential invisible watcher standing just beyond the door, eyes following my every flailing move in the back. I reached the point where a foot might have been. I slid my hand out. <sighs> Nothing. Just carpet. Shaking my hand and struggling to contain my terror at threats both real and imagined, I crawled down the hallway, eyes burning. I couldn't blink. I couldn't close my eyes even for a second despite seeing nothing. I was too afraid I'd miss a split-second errant flashlight or some other detail that would confirm that there really were assailants preparing to enter my house. I was desperate to hurry, but I didn't dare make a sound. I reached the end of the hallway after what felt like an eternity, still listening to muttering and the sound of tinkering. It was only when I crawled past the doorframe, angled wood under my fingers, that I heard the first recognizable words against my now sweaty ear. It's good. It's off? Another voice asked. The first replied with an affirmative tone. Crawling up the wall as fast as I dared, I felt around for the window's frame. 
There. I slid up heavy curtains against the back of my head and peered out. Straining my open eyes made no difference. All I could see was the extremely faint glow of my cell phone, barely visible against the panes as I pressed my forehead against the glass. More audible words came. What's that? I ducked, my nerves screaming. Idiot. Had they seen the faint light on my phone? Just thought I saw something. Keeping my phone down near my chest, I peered back over. The window was still as good as useless, no matter how hard I stared into... There. The tiniest peripheral motion, a blur, a blip of pale blue, a cell phone light through jeans fabric. Somewhere downstairs, a doorknob jiggled. The noise was ever so slight. I'd have never given it a second thought if I'd heard it in any other situation. I slumped. Frozen against the wall in terror, I ran through all the objects in the house I might use as a weapon. I ran through all the scenarios I'd seen in movies, guessed at my best options for defending myself until the calm voice spoke in my thoughts. Idiot. Call the police. I'd never called the police before. I never even considered it. With the phone pressed against my ear, full of terror, I hadn't even... I quickly hung up and dialed 911. The conversation was somewhat of a blur for me. I remember repeating more than was necessary that they were already in my house. Multiple men. No, I live alone. They cut the power, cut the security system. Please come now. Please come now. A creak sounded from the stairs. Surging with adrenaline, I hung up the phone and clicked it dark. Another creak emanated from the same place. Part of me twisted up terribly, preparing for imminent violence. Two, then, were upstairs. Were there more downstairs? I couldn't hear anything. A hushed whisper reached my ears, coming from somewhere in the hallway. Right outside the door of the room I cowered in. Ten seconds passed. Thirty. A minute. Two minutes at least. And then five. Staring into the void, I hovered at the edge of sheer panic for an eternity. What the hell were they doing? Were they just standing there in the hallway or were they searching the rooms not making any noise? I had the terrible premonition that if I made a single sound, no matter how slight, they would suddenly rush me for some unexpected direction with violent and mindless glee. I almost didn't register it at first. Not the moment it happened. I felt a vibration in my clenched hand, but I couldn't quite fathom it immediately. Between my desperate fingers, the phone rang loudly, practically screaming, filling the house with abrupt noise. It was the same number, misdialing me a third time, signing my death warrant. The fuck was that? A threatening voice asked, two rooms down. I dropped the phone, leaving it to ring on the carpet and bolted away from the window. Face up, the phone's dim light peeled back just enough of the darkness to fill the room with imminent danger. But with no closet and no furniture, I had nowhere to go. The unopened moving boxes filling the room offered no safety. More than one set of footsteps rushed down the hall, the heavy falls filled with violent urgency. It's just a phone, one said a few feet away from me. Yeah? An angry voice asked. What's it doing on the floor here? Who knows, maybe he's lazy. I watched his routine for weeks. He ain't home. A deadly click sounded and I stopped breathing. A flashlight beam swept across the room, blinding me. I kept my eyes open, unwilling to close them for fear of the two men hearing my eyelids slam shut. Finally, the phone stopped ringing, going dark with an abrupt wave of silence. Right, 
the angry one said after a moment. Computers up here somewhere. We'll get that television downstairs next. The two men walked back into the hall, moving within an inch of me for the second time. Taking a cue from the invisible watcher I'd imagined outside my office door, I bolted for the hallway itself, not to run down the stairs, which would have creaked and given me away, not down the hall where I would have run into the two men, no. I'd slid right up against the wall right outside the door, hidden in the angling curtain of blackness afforded by the flashlight's roving beam. As they entered and exited the room, curving around me, they literally brushed past, clothing touching clothing, but whichever one it had been, he hadn't noticed. I could still smell sweat and cigarettes. The foul odor lingered in front of my face. Without so much as moving my head, I strained my eyes to watch the silhouettes and flashlight beam move down the hall. My will to stay motionless gave out, and I slid back into the room as best I could, just as the beam swept back down the hall. An idle glance back that might have gotten me killed had they done it a moment earlier. There was nothing left to do but wait. Eternity, infinity, endless raging fear and torment. It drained me until I was nothing but a shell, listening to my house being ransacked, no longer even energetic enough to fear being discovered. I was alone, drained, and at my wit's end. Death might have almost been a welcome relief. Twenty minutes, they told me later. It was only twenty minutes. The utility repairman was kind enough to come the next day. Once he fixed the box in the yard, I kept everything fully lit, attempting to work despite boundless nervousness and twitch reactions to every little sound in the house. Every so often, I tried to smooth out a new scuff on my nearly stolen computer monitor. Never worked. But it felt vaguely therapeutic. The phone rang again, just about twilight. I stared at it in muted horror, my entire body filled with the animal urge to flee, but simultaneously paralyzed by a prior night's trauma. Somewhere between those two urges, compromise led me to answer the new number. Hey, just calling to check up on you. A calming, familiar voice greeted me. I'd gone down to the station with the officers, filling out a statement. The policemen had laughed at first, hearing the tale of my misdials, but they respectfully grew quiet when they realized that I was serious. Thanks, I replied, calming down. A creak sounded on the stairs. I jumped, then shook my head. Yeah, not every day something like this happens around here, the sergeant said. You're new to town, I know. I just don't want you worried this will ever happen again. Oh, I'm not afraid. I lied. Thanks for your concern. Yep. Oh, by the way, we figured out how you had your number. You had a part-time with the movers you used. Probably used the job to scope out folks to rob, and you, that big house, living alone, probably seemed like an easy target. The first voice on the mist dial. The memory finally clicked into place. I blinked, feeling strangely violated by the realization. That man... He'd answered when I called the moving company, seeking their services. He'd been in my house, cataloging my possessions, eyeing them for later theft. Yep, the sergeant said again, and I heard him lean back in his creaky leather chair. Just be happy that you had that lucky call. Damnest thing I've ever heard. Something's looking out for you. These same guys killed a farmer out your way two, three months ago. Went to rob, but the guy was home. Now I know it was them. They're going away for sure. My blood ran cold. Thanks, Sergeant. That makes me feel better. I lied. Why the hell did he have to tell me that? Sure, gotta get back to work. Now you take care. I hung up the phone with a shiver. 
My eyes traveled to that spot outside my office door where the angled lamplight still carved that sheer black pane, similar to the one that had hidden me from a roving flashlight and saved my life. I had the strangest notion again that someone was standing there in the pitch unseen, watching me. The sensation of presence of being watched grew thicker, anticipatory, almost tangible, as if the invisible observer might suddenly step forward out of the darkness and into reality. Thanks, I blurted. A single word, a sincere message spoken before I even realized I was thinking it. The feeling vanished. Tilting the lamp, I angled the dark curtain back, but there was no one there. Motivated by my questioning emotion without verbal thought, I walked down the hall to the room overlooking the backyard. I moved through the darkness, unafraid, my target already memorized despite my best attempts at forgetting. Near the window where I'd peered out and seen the men breaking in, I opened a box I'd left sealed for far too long. The object in question was at the top brought it back to my office and set it up on the desk. Her picture, facing me. Her face was as bright and cheery as ever, her life still vibrant in frozen sunlight. I smiled for the first time in several weeks. Living alone? <laughs> Maybe not so much. I didn't notice the blood when the woman got into the back seat of my car. Thanks for the pickup. I glanced back in my rearview mirror. We were still under the bright lights of the hospital's front entrance, but the reflected glow still only gave me a vague idea of the woman sitting behind me. In her early forties, pretty, with intense eyes that met mine in the reflection as I spoke. Sure thing. You didn't say on the app where you wanted to go. Just tell me the address if you can, and I'll put it into the GPS. She nodded and looked out the window. Um, I'm still trying to decide, I guess. Can you just drive for now? I've only used a ride share a couple of times, but you can do that, right? Just drive around and charge me for the distance or time or whatever? I hit the button on my app for roaming tolls before putting the car in drive. Yeah, sure. It'll use my phone's GPS to keep track of how far we go, and it will ding every 25 bucks, so you can just keep track, okay? When I checked the mirror, the woman was still looking outside, and in a passing beam of light, I saw how worried she looked. My general rule was that I didn't talk much unless the writer wanted to, but given her expression and the fact that I just picked her up from a hospital, I felt like I should at least open the door to chatting if she wanted. I'm Marvin, by the way. It's good to meet you. She glanced my way with a ghost of a smile before looking back out into the passing night. Carolyn, it's good to meet you too. So were you visiting someone at the hospital? I told myself that would be my last question, my last attempt to pry or be supportive of some stranger without a sign from her that she wanted to talk. A pause, and then, yeah, a friend of mine. My best friend when I was a kid. Oh, well, I hope they're doing okay. Well, um, she died tonight. I felt my stomach lurch. Why had I even opened this can of worms? What was I going to do or say that could make this lady feel better? Nothing. And now I was just caught in it. And I should just stay quiet, but I could already hear myself saying, oh no. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, I guess. I, I guess it's a good thing that you got a chance to be there and say goodbye. If that was even true. What if she died before she got there, or if she never went in to see her? 
All I was doing was making this woman talk about something painful for no reason. I was pulled out of my thoughts by a short, harsh laugh from the back seat. <laughs> yeah, I had to say goodbye, all right. Goodbye and hello, I guess. I just nodded, forcing myself to stay quiet. Maybe if I didn't ask any more questions, we could just ride in silence the rest of the way to wherever we were going. As it was, I was just driving around aimlessly, taking routes I was familiar with that had light traffic this time of night. If she didn't pick a place by the time we reached the end of the circuits, I'd asked again if she wanted to go somewhere particular or just keep riding. I didn't mind driving her all night, but I didn't really want to. Did you play games a lot as a kid? Not video games like people do now, but real games where you run around and play? I glanced up and nodded. Sure, didn't everybody? Carolyn shrugged. Maybe most did, but I was an only child. And until I was eight, we didn't live near any other children. When Penny and her family moved down the road, we became friends fast. Her and her brother, Jonah, were always at my house, or me over at theirs, and the big stretch of woods between the two of us was our playground. I laughed. <laughs> yeah, me and my brother used to play war in the woods behind our old school. There were like five or six of us most of the time. It was a wonder we never got snake bit. Her voice was thoughtful and distant as she responded. Yeah, we played that once or twice, but we spent more time playing hide-and-seek or building bases, pretending we were explorers and adventurers. The woods were probably only about a hundred acres of land, but we made the most of it. We knew every inch and felt at home there, you know? Sure, yeah. And then her cousin Elizabeth came and everything changed. Elizabeth was a small, shy girl. Four years younger than Jonah and two years younger than me and Penny, who were ten. She reminded me of, well, me. She was quiet, lonely, excited, and terrified at the prospect of new friends. But we weren't mean kids. Even Jonah, who was almost a teenager and could have thought himself above playing with his younger sister and her friend, was always sweet and patient and fun to be around. When Elizabeth came, we immediately included her in everything we did. She was only going to be visiting for a month while her mother had some kind of medical procedure, but we were going to make sure she had a good time while she was there. At first, that just meant letting her tag along and including her in our games. As she warmed up to us, she clearly felt more comfortable and would talk more, but she never lost a certain strangeness. She would sometimes stare off into space, and more than once we lost track of her in the woods, and spent a panicked few minutes trying to find her before she'd pop up from behind a tree or a clump of bushes. It was frustrating and a bit odd, mainly because overall she seemed very smart and mature for her age, and sometimes, well, sometimes, she had a little smirk on her face when she didn't think I was looking. Like she was in on a joke we weren't or something. It had a sneaky look that I didn't like. Still, overall, she was cool, you know? And even when she was being weird, she fit in well enough. She went where we wanted to go and played what we wanted to play. So when she asked if she could pick the game... We said yes. The game didn't have a name. Or if it did, she never told us what it was. And after the first time we played it, we just called it the game, as it was the only thing we played until... Well, until everything was over. It started with drawing a circle in the dirt. Everyone did it. You stood away from each other and took a stick to draw a circle around yourself. Then you take your rock. Elizabeth was always very clear at this point. You always started with a stick in your right hand, held up to the sky, and a rock in your left hand down by your side. 
when Jonah did it wrong the first time, well, it was one of the first few times I ever saw their cousin get really mad. Anyway, you draw your circle and then close your eyes. She said you could spin around with your eyes closed if you wanted to, but you didn't have to, and you had to be careful if you did that, you didn't leave your circle. Spin or not, when everyone was ready, you tossed your rocks and opened your eyes. The idea was that whoever had one of their rocks closest to their circle became the hunter, and the rest were the hunted. At first, it just sounded like a more elaborate way of playing tag or hide-and-seek, but when Penny said something like that, Elizabeth shook her head. She said that there was more to it than that, but we'd have to wait and see. That... That first time, Jonah had a rock at the edge of his circle, so he was the hunter. When he asked Elizabeth what he was supposed to do, she told him to walk into the woods until he had counted slow to 200. After that, he could start his hunt. Looking back, even then, it didn't make sense how we reacted to any of this. I remember watching Jonah walk off into the woods, and I didn't feel bored or think it was silly. I was excited. No, I wasn't just excited. I was scared. I was scared of what might happen if he caught me. I tried to smooth away my frown as I looked back at Carolyn. Man, sounds like an intense kid's game, I guess. I let out a weak laugh. We usually just threw rocks at each other. She nodded. Yeah, right? It was weird. This little eight-year-old girl had this elaborate game, and we were not only listening to her, but we were into it. The three of us scattered into the trees, and after finding one of my favorite hiding spots, I hunkered down to wait. The woods. I remember how still everything was. Normally you'd hear birds and bugs, branches falling or being moved by deer or whatever else lived out there, but there was none of that now. Just perfect silence, like everything was frozen or dead. And that's when I heard the voice call out. It seemed far away, and while the words were clear, I couldn't tell who had said them. Maybe it was Jonah? I don't know. I just know it didn't sound like him, and the suddenness of it made me shiver as I fought not to yell or run. Bring out the long knives! I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I sat huddled in the hollowed-out tree. The same tree I'd used to evade discovery and capture in numerous pretend games before. Penny and Jonah didn't know this hiding spot, and neither should Elizabeth, which made it hard not to let out a scream when I heard whispered voice from close by. He's coming this way. I hope he doesn't find you. She ran off with a giggle, moving out of my narrow field of vision inside the tree and somewhere further to my left. I was about to shift to try and see her again when movement to the right caught my eye. It was Jonah, but something was wrong. He wasn't smiling or laughing like he usually would be while playing a game. Even when he was focused, his darkest look was usually one of stern concentration. But now, he looked cold and hard as he raked his eyes across the path in front of him stalking forward a few steps before pausing to look and listen for a second and then prowling again. Still as jarring as how he looked and moved was, it really wasn't the main thing I focused on. It was the sticks in his hand. He had two long, thick sticks held upright and rigid with grips so tight that even at a distance... I could see the muscles standing out in his arms. 
We rarely ever used sticks or stones in our games except as building tools, and these were clearly being held as some kind of weapons. Jonah stopped again and looked in the direction of the tree I was in. My heart stopped as I froze in place, wishing I'd stayed further back, praying to somehow become invisible. This wasn't the normal fear of losing a child's game. It was... It was terror. And I realized how scared I really was. A strange thought slipped into my head like a stranger's sigh. Those aren't sticks. Those are his long knives. I shuddered then, but he had already turned away, his attention now focused on something outside my view. Shifting quietly, I watched as he moved forward, his whole body tensed now, like a snake, ready to strike. He was about to move out of my vision again when Elizabeth let out a scream and ran back into my direction. Maybe she was just running away, or maybe she was going to lead him to me, but either way, he didn't give her a chance to get far. He struck her once across the back, and she fell down, and then he used the second stick to dig into her back, even as I started crawling from my hiding spot and yelling for him to stop. He didn't look up until I was close by. And even then, there was a long moment when I was afraid. Afraid of how strange he seemed. Even afraid he might turn his sticks on me. But then his face cleared and he dropped his weapons. Penny was already running up by this point. Her face red with anger. What the hell, Jonah? Did you knock her down? Frowning at him, I stepped over and offered a hand to Elizabeth. She took it and got to her feet quietly as I looked past him to the sister. He was using sticks. He hit her with them. Jonah flushed with embarrassment. I... I wasn't trying to hurt her. I, I thought that's how the game was supposed to be played. Penny was next to him now, jabbing him in the ribs. We didn't say that. Elizabeth didn't say that. You just wanted to be a mean shithead. He backed away, shaking his head. I swear, I, I didn't. It was like I just knew that was part of the rules. His eyes lit up and he remembered something. And, and when you guys yelled that about the long knives, I knew that's what it meant somehow. I found the sticks and then I started looking for you. I felt my eyes widen. I didn't yell that. It didn't sound like Penny or Elizabeth either. Jonah frowned. I mean, it didn't sound like you either, I guess, but I, I swear it wasn't me. I just... He was tearing up now. I wasn't trying to hurt her. I, I thought it was just part of the... It was. You played the way it was supposed to be played. We all turned back to look at Elizabeth as she regarded us calmly with a smile. I'm not hurt, guys. And he did what the hunter is supposed to do. He hunted one of us down with the long knives. Elizabeth shrugged. I yelled out the knife part. I guess he's a good guesser because he figured out the rest even though I don't remember telling you that part. She grinned. I'll do better next time. I blinked as I turned onto the freeway. Next time? You didn't play that shit again, I hope. When there was only silence, I glanced at Carolyn's reflection. Did you? She was rubbing her hand in the shadows of the back seat, seemingly lost in thought for a moment before answering. We did. I... It's hard to explain. I could just say it's because we were dumb, bored kids, but it was more than that. We were all scared after that first time, but it didn't stop us from coming back and doing it the next day, and then a few days after that. We all got turns as the hunter, we all had times when we got hunted down, and Elizabeth had lied. But the stakes hurt plenty. I frowned in the mirror. Then why did you keep playing? Or why be so rough? I saw her dark silhouette shake her head. It was different when you were playing. It's like there was nothing but the game. 
and when you were out of it, it never seemed as bad as it really was. And that was just when you were hiding. When you were the one hunting, it felt like being in a dream. You were somewhere else. Someone else. And all you waited to do was find your prey. I... I'd like to say it was scary. And it was. But it was exciting, too. It didn't take long before we were addicted to it. Playing it every day and going home hiding bruises and making excuses for how we got the scrapes and cuts our parents did see. I puffed out a breath. <laughs> Shit. Weren't you worried about really hurting each other? Maybe a little. I know I worried about it some. Not just us getting hurt, but the strangeness of it all. But it was like all of that. That worried voice inside that was really me, it was kind of... muffled. And that voice didn't start really screaming until I saw Elizabeth meeting with the man in the woods. Like I said, sometimes she would disappear. And even with our new obsession with the game, we didn't play it all the time, so there were days where she would suddenly go missing for a few minutes or more. We'd gotten used to it over the last three weeks, but my unease continued to quietly grow. So did my paranoia about Elizabeth. She was the one who had taught us the game after all, and despite her age and seemingly perfect, nice, and innocent overall, I still felt like she was the one in control. So one day, when I noticed her slip off, I followed her. She walked for a good distance before turning down into a marshy area toward the back of the woods. The trees were darker and twisted there. Swamp cypresses that didn't exist in the rest of our playground. Against the gray black of their bark, it took me a moment to even see the man standing there. He wore a long black coat that was sleek, reminding me of something between a cowboy's duster and the kind of sea coat I imagined a sailor wearing during a terrible storm. He towered over Elizabeth, inclining down a massive head topped with a crooked stovepipe hat of midnight black that glistened with something that might have been rain or dew, but looked darker and thicker, with bits of moss from the trees sticking to the wide brim. Below that brim, I could only see a small patch of gray skin. Between the angle I was at and the high collar of his coat, there was a little space to see the man inside, but when he crouched down next to Elizabeth, the bottom of the coat pushed back, and I was able to see dark leather boots coated in white mud or clay, black pants leading up to a brown belt with a metal buckle and straps that trailed to... holsters, I guess? Maybe when it's not a gun, it's better to call them sheaths. Because on both his hips, polished to a high silvery sheen with points that bit sharply into the moist earth when he crouched down and whispered to the girl, were a pair of blades. Too small to be swords, maybe, and too big to be daggers. But of course, I already knew what they were. They were his long knives. I glanced up from then to find Elizabeth looking at me, looking at me and laughing. I jumped and ran. I didn't understand any of this, but I knew it was dangerous. No more than that, it was deadly. And whatever spell I'd been under, it was at least temporarily broken. I had to get Penny and Jonah and get us out of the woods. Bring out the long knives! The sound no doubt came from behind me, but it seemed to err from every direction. Shaking, I kept running, screaming for my friends, yelling them to come on. We had to get out. That something was after us. When I made my way back to where we'd been hanging out, only Penny was there looking confused and terrified. She said that Jonah had gone to the house to get us some snacks, but that had been a few minutes ago. Not wanting to waste a second, I grabbed her hand and told her to come on, that we had to get to their house. 
To her credit, she didn't question me, but just ran. We made it out of the woods and headed toward her house, calling for Jonah the entire time. We never saw him, and it wasn't until we'd made it up the front porch that we heard him screaming from the woods. Penny wanted to go back for him, but I made her come inside, told her I'd call somebody to get help. And that's just what I did. I called my mom, and then her dad, then the police. They all got there about the same time, and within a few minutes, half a dozen people were out in the woods looking for Jonah and Elizabeth. They found Jonah quick enough. He was... He'd been butchered, cut to pieces. Elizabeth, they searched for hours in that small patch of woods, but it wasn't until late that night that someone found her. She was hungry and dirty, but otherwise perfectly fine. I didn't know what to say, or how any of this could be true. Finally, I just offered. I'm so sorry. That's terrible. Did they ever find the guy? Did you ever find out what Elizabeth was doing talking to him? The bitterness in the woman's voice was palpable. <laughs> Oh, no. And his parents were devastated by Jonah's murder, and in less than a month, they'd moved back to the West Coast. I never saw Elizabeth again. Oh, I did talk to her once years later. You did? How? When I was in college, I was telling my roommate about some of this. Not all of it, just a watered-down version that didn't make me look crazy. And it made me kind of nostalgic. No, that's a lie. It, it made me feel guilty. I could have done more to try and stay in touch with Penny, but honestly, I was terrified. Terrified of what had happened of her cousin and, by extinction, anything to do with her. So I'd never written or called her, and the couple of times she wrote me, I never responded. I puffed out of breath. <laughs> well, I mean, you were a kid. And anyone would be scared after all that. Yeah, maybe, but... It was still shitty, and I still felt bad about it. So I called home, got my mother to dig up her old number, and tried calling it. I don't know if she still lived there or not, but when a young woman answered, I got excited. I asked if it was Penny I was talking to. She said it was Elizabeth. Actually... No. What she said was, No, Emily. It's Elizabeth. Penny can't come to the phone right now. I heard her sigh. I should have argued or tried calling back, but I felt that old fear again at hearing her voice, and I chickened out. A couple of years later, my parents heard that Elizabeth had died, and I thought about reaching out to Penny again, but something kept me from it. The fear in my stomach wasn't dead, I guess. It was just asleep. So, jump ahead two days ago. I haven't talked to, about Penny to anyone in, well, probably more than 20 years when I suddenly get a call from her. She's in the hospital. The hospital you picked me up at tonight. She's there and she's never going to leave because she's dying. She's dying. She wants to see her best friend again before she goes. I go to say I'm sorry again, but she's still talking, her voice louder and quicker now. I fly out here this morning, and when I go to see her, she's all alone and deep asleep. I feel so bad, and she looks so worn down and old compared to the little girl I remembered. How bad had things gotten for her that she needed to reach out to a childhood friend who had abandoned her? I watched her quietly for better than an hour, then, before she woke up. And when she did, the smile on her face. It was both so beautiful and so sad. 
and we hugged and cried for a while. It was in the midst of all that that I realized she was saying something. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I pull back, confused, and that's when I see her hand. It's freshly cut and bleeding from a razor blade she has in her other hand. Before I can react, she grabs my wrist and slashes the back of my hand, pressing her bloody wound against mine as she screams out, Bring out the long knives! I... I pulled away then, just trying to distance myself, planning on going to get help. Penny wasn't even looking at me, but at the corner of the room, at something only she could see. When she looked back at me, she was still crying, but her eyes were full of terror. Yanking her head back, she ran the razor across her throat, fast and deep. They... They tried to save her, but she slipped away too fast. Jesus, I just slipped out before I thought. I mean, that's terrible. I'm sure they tried, but if she was already dying. Carolyn gave a laugh. (laughs) That's the thing. She wasn't. I talked to one of the nurses that wrapped my hand up. She was in for an elective. She only had to check in that morning because of her blood pressure. They wanted to monitor her for a day before putting her under anesthesia. It it was all a trap. For me. I slowed the car to a stop at a red light. We were in the shipping district near the airport now. Just empty roads and storage warehouses for the next few blocks. I turned around to look at her. This is all... I don't understand. How is it a trap for you? I almost stopped there, but then I added, And why are you telling me all this? The woman leaned forward and met my eyes. I didn't understand it all at first either. I knew some things from what she'd written in her letters as a child. She talked about Elizabeth and the thing that was with her, how they still made her and others play the game from time to time. I think she'd had a hard childhood, and when Elizabeth died, however she died, this thing got passed on to Penny. She sniffed and sat back in the darkness. Penny was always a very good person. She tried to not give in to it. I think it's been years since it really got to play the game or even just hunt someone, but fighting all the time, I guess they just wanted out, but it won't kill you if you're the one it's bound to, and it won't let you hurt yourself. That's why she had to bind it to me before she could die. I want to feel betrayed, but I never tried to help her, and I can't imagine what a lifetime of this will be like. I frowned. But even if I believed all this stuff, how how would you know all that? Some from the letters when she was a kid, maybe, but the stuff about it not killing the one it's bound to or how long it's been since it's got to kill anybody, did she tell you all that tonight? She leaned forward again and shook her head, her eyes moving past me and out into the night. Not her. Him. I felt a chill go up my spine as I turned around and looked in the direction she was staring. There was nothing there. It was just a patch of poorly lit sidewalk and a rundown street between blocks of where... Bring out the long knives sound was a whisper, her breath curling against my ear as she said it almost like a lover's promise. I went to turn in her direction, but then I stopped. There was something out there now. 
It was murky at first, like a camera that was out of focus, but as I stared in horror, it came fully into view. A tall man in black, a shiny coat wearing a dirty, crooked top hat. I couldn't make out his face in the shadows, but I saw something glittering there. Hard, cold eyes that were boring into me as he moved long-fingered hands to his waist and he was pulling out his knives. Fuck this. I gripped the wheel and stomped on the gas, shooting forward as I tried to watch the figure recede in my side mirror. All I had to do was get somewhere populated, maybe the airport, and then you can't run from him. He has to kill. It's been too long, and if I don't let him, well... Just because I can't hurt myself doesn't mean he can't make me suffer. He showed me enough in the hour before I ordered a car to convince me of that. I... I'm sorry, but you should just stop and let it happen. I gripped the wheel tighter as I barely made a turn. Thank God this part of the city was dead at night. This has to be a trick, or you're in it now. You can see him. You know it's not a trick. I really am sorry, but I didn't have a choice. It's out of my hands. She was right. And worse, every time I looked in the mirror, no matter how far we went, I could usually catch a glimpse of him close behind, standing somewhere and staring as though he was just waiting for us to get tired and stop. Then something occurred to me. What about other people? What? You said you can't hurt yourself, but can other people hurt you? I don't know what you... Let's find out. Stomping the gas as far as it would go, I kept straight at the next turn. It was a brick security wall, but my hope was that the seatbelt and airbags would be enough to... When I woke up, the air smelled burnt and stale and everything seemed to shimmer as I pushed back on the airbag and shoved my door open. Looking into the back seat, I could make Carolyn out enough to see that she had a fresh gash near her ear, but I wasn't sure I wanted to reach in and check for a pulse. A line of blood began to drip into my eye from a cut on my forehead. Better I just get away from here and then call 911. Maybe by then I'd be safe. That thing would be gone, or... He was across the street staring at me. Oh, shit. I took off running, and when I looked back, I saw it was chasing me, knives out again, as it charged down the street after me. Fear and survival instinct flooded my brain, pushing out all my questions and doubts. I had to get away. I had to hide, then call for help. Patting my pockets as I ran, I realized I left my phone in the fucking car. This... I'd hide then. Or, if I couldn't find a place to hide, I'd try to circle back around and get to my phone if I didn't find another person to help me first. The man kept pace with me for the next two blocks, and by the second left turn, my sides were already burning. I had no doubt that he could run me down if he wanted. He was enjoying the chase, playing with me, and I had to do something different before he got tired of it. Pushing myself harder, I rounded the last turn and saw my smoking car in the distance. I looked back a last time. He was still there, but he had let me get a bit farther ahead. Maybe it would buy me a few seconds, but not enough time to make a call and get help. I needed to find some other... I saw the rear door open as Carolyn stepped out of the car and looked around. She seemed shaken up but was fairly steady on her feet as she looked my way and then began walking quickly in the opposite direction. I shifted my focus from the car to her and despite her attempts to speed up, the wreck had taken too much out of her. I caught up and when I grabbed her from behind, she was only able to fight back a moment before we both fell to the ground. I wanted to threaten her, get her to call it off, or at least apologize for what I was going to try. 
and maybe it wouldn't work anyway, but it was the only thing I could think of, and oh shit, he was running towards us, and I rolled on top of Carolyn and grabbed her head, ignoring her fist as they hammered into my ribs. Bending down, I pressed my split forehead against the trickling wound below her temple. My eyes were squeezed tight as I screamed with all my fear and anger out into the night, BRING OUT THE LONG KNIVES! I heard the heavy sounds of boots on the asphalt next to us, and when I rolled off the woman I was staring up at the thing's face. It wasn't a man. Nothing like a person at all when you saw it this close. What was it? Oh, God, what was it? And why did it keep staring at me? His eyes shifted, moving to the gasping woman that was trying to catch her breath as she crawled away on her back. You... You stay away from me. You said you wouldn't hurt me, remember? I followed her. When she reached the sidewalk, she gave up pleading with the monster and looked back at me. Please, tell it to take someone else. I sat up as I forced myself to meet her gaze. I'm sorry. It's out of my hands. As I turned away, I heard the long knives begin to do their work. My Aunt Nancy mentioned the mosquito trunk the first night I stayed with her. It was weird. Not just that she had mentioned it at all, but more the way she mentioned it. Almost as though she was cautioning me about a local mean dog that was prone to bite. Be careful if you go out at night, honey. The neighborhood is still okay, but it's not as safe as it once was. And a few streets over, they've been fighting a real drug problem. And, she added with a nervous glance towards the window... Just make sure you're back in by midnight. About one is when the mosquito truck comes around. I frowned at her. You mean like one of those sprayer trucks that spray the bug poison? She shrugged and waved away the question. I don't know about all that, but I do know it's not good to be out when it comes around. Licking her lips, she put on a smile. Just make sure you're home and the door's locked by then, okay? Returning her smile, I tried to hide my confusion. This wasn't like my aunt. She was older, sure, but she wasn't dotty and she wasn't scared to stay by herself. The only reason I was there at all was because my uncle was in the hospital, and starting the following night, Aunt Nancy was going to spend most nights up there with him and didn't want their two cats to be lonely with their people gone. Still, oddity aside, I had too much going on to think about it for too long. This week was supposed to be a vacation of sorts, but it was going to be a working one. I had the first draft of my thesis paper due for review by the following week, and I was at least 20 pages from being done. Between that and making sure my aunt and uncle were doing okay at the hospital, I completely forgot my plan to stop by the store on the way back from checking on them, and it wasn't until early midnight that my rumbling stomach forced me away from the laptop in the direction of the kitchen. The pantry and refrigerator were both... Well, they were far from empty, but between the stuff that was alarmingly old and the stuff that was just gross-looking, I quickly went from planning to just scavenge until the next day to putting on my shoes and heading for my car. I did pause as I was grabbing my keys to think about what my aunt had said, but immediately discounted it. I wasn't sure if she was worried about us breathing in poison fumes or what, but it was silly. The city wouldn't let them spray stuff if it was bad to breathe, and I didn't plan on staying out in it anyway. Besides, I just wanted to grab some drinks, pizza, and some sandwich stuff, so I should be back before it came anyway. When I came back and pulled into my aunt's driveway, I found my gaze pulled down the street. She was right. It was still a cute neighborhood, but it was going down. The houses had been built probably 70 or 80 years earlier, and I had yet to see a neighbor that was under 60. 
The place next door had railings coated in cracked yellowed paint and shutters that hung crooked and wrong, and Nancy and Jack's house looked more gray than the white that I remembered from my last few visits a few years earlier. Now that I thought about it, the whole street had a feeling of age and disuse that felt a little sad and I felt my heart leap as I saw a pair of headlights down at the far end of the street. Glancing at the dash clock, I saw it was already 12.59. Grabbing my bags, I jumped out of the car and walked fast to the front door, fumbling for the key for a few seconds before remembering Nancy's key was on another key ring in my front pocket. I heard the low growl of a muffler behind me and turned to look, expecting to see a big tank spewing white clouds of smoke out the back. Instead, it was a small blue SUV packed full of kids that looked too young to be out so late. Shaking my head, I opened the door and went inside. It wasn't until I was eating frozen pizza a few minutes later that the strangeness of my reaction struck me. It's one thing to intentionally spook yourself. I think everyone has had times where they played at being scared in the dark or made a game or a race out of something from their imagination. But this wasn't that. I had... I'd really been a little scared I wouldn't get inside in time, though. I couldn't say why. Frowning, I put the pizza down. Suddenly, I wasn't hungry anymore. Beautiful day, isn't it? I looked up from my phone to see a silver-haired lady flapping a hand covered in a gardening glove at me in an enthusiastic wave. Smiling, I stopped walking toward my car and waved back. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice day. After an awkward pause, I added, I'm Brian. I'm... Well, Nancy and Jack are my aunt and uncle. The woman walked toward me from the yard next door, removing a glove and offering a handshake as she drew closer. I'm Gladys. I heard about your uncle's heart attack. She frowned slightly. Is he doing okay? I nodded. Yeah, they think he'll be home by this weekend. I'm just here keeping an eye on the house and the cats while she's up at the hospital with him. I don't think they'd like to be apart for long. Gladys raised an eyebrow. Your aunt and uncle, or them and the cats? I laughed. (laughs) I guess both, now that you mention it. Chuckling, she nodded and pointed back to a face of a small poodle staring intently at us from the window. That's the way it is with me and Trudy. (laughs) They're a, a lot of company, aren't they? Yeah, they are. I glanced back down at my phone. It was nice meeting you. I I need to get to the hospital. I'm gonna make my aunt take a break and go get something to eat. Gladys smiled. Sounds like she has a good nephew. Tell them everybody on the street misses them. I wound up spending an entire afternoon at the hospital, and that night, after an hour checking citations in my paper, I was ready to lay in bed and watch TV. I was in the guest bedroom, which put my window toward Gladys's house, and when I looked out, I could see the dim orange glow of a lamp through what I guessed was her living room window. She was a nice old lady. Her and her little... When I woke up, it was to the sound of a woman yelling outside, and it took me a moment to figure out it was Gladys calling for Trudy over and over. Looking out the window, I saw her small silhouette, silver hair softly glowing above a blue robe as she shined a flashlight around at the bushes bordering her house. Slipping on my shoes, I went outside to see what was wrong. It's Trudy. She asked to go out. She she never asked to go out so late, but she acted like she really needed to go, and she ran around the house. Now I can't find her. Her voice was thick with emotion, and she looked between me and the shadowy yard. She never runs off like that. Always comes right back when she's done with her business. I... Trudy! Come here, sweetie! Come to Mama! She shook her head again, looking lost as she started around the house. I'll be right back. Let me grab my phone and I'll use the light to help you look for her. She lifted a hand absently. Thank you, honey. Running back inside, I started looking for my phone. Where had I left it? 
I had it when I was on the laptop, but did I bring it to bed? Yeah, I was looking at it during that stupid show. My hand closed around it in this tangle of sheets, and as I turned it over, I saw the time. 1.02 Outside, I heard the heavy rumble of an engine as something large drew near. Turning to the window, I first saw Gladys holding Trudy, now as her expression went from one of tearful joy to a kind of terror that... I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone so scared in real life. My gaze followed her own out to the street where the dark thing had lurched to a hissing stop. That's when I first saw the mosquito truck. It had a long, angled front that reminded me more of the cowcatcher on a train than the grill of a work truck, but it did curve back to a rounded cab and then to the load it carried behind. I say curve, but in the moonlight it looked more like it flowed, as though the entire body of the trunk had been made from one single piece of metal or a dull gray rock. None of its lines were straight or symmetrical, making it look like something carved or sculpted more than assembled aluminum or steel from a factory floor. Behind the cab was a large bulge, covered in black canvas, draping almost to the street below. As I watched, two hoses slid out from beneath the edge of the fabric, and it was only as they were being picked up that I noticed the figures holding them. They must have come from the truck, though I hadn't noticed. Instead, it was as though they just appeared, stepping from the shadows under the canvas or the light itself. One tall and fat, the other small and painfully thin. They were both clad in rubber suits and full gas masks as they drunk the hoses towards Gladys's house. For her part, Gladys still looked terrified, even more scared than before, if that was possible. She started walking quickly toward the front door, clearly trying to make it before the masked figures reached her. When she spoke again, even through the glass, I could hear the fear in her voice. I'm sorry. I, I, I just had to get my dog. I, I'm going in. Please, I'm going in. I could feel my own confused fear growing, but there was an anger there, too. Who were these guys, and why were they bothering that nice old woman? I headed for the door, aware even that my indignation and willingness to help was, while well-intentioned, not really very brave. I was still traveling on the assumption that the world was relatively safe and sane, that I could step outside, make vague threats and demands. What were they doing there? Who was their superior? Did they want to get sued? Where was their authorization for any of this? And make them cower and go away. Help Gladys a little while making myself feel good. All just by applying the slightest bit of leverage to the systems that were already in place. The social physics of a world where neighborhoods meant civilization and people meant safety. A squeaky wheel gets the grease and a place that is safe tends to stay safe. And then I walked out the front door. Immediately, one of the two figures, the larger one, turned and headed in my direction fast. I felt a surge of panic, but forced myself to hold my ground as I looked over to Gladys' porch. She'd made it, but the little one had too, and as she turned to look back, it twisted its hose. Green smoke billowed out, enveloping Gladys and Trudy in a thick cloud even as they staggered back through the door and inside. I called out for them to stop, but then the large one was to me, grabbing my arm in a hard, implacable grip. What are you doing here? The sound was muffled and raspy because of the mask, but there was something else in that voice, too. An underlying clicking sound, like the ticking of an electric meter or the scraping rhythm of an old gramophone. Yeah, that was it. It had that cold, watery sound that old recordings sometimes had. A sound that reminded you of metal on wax cut a long time ago. I... This is my aunt's house. What are you doing to Gladys? A pause and a rasp, and then... It's not your time yet. 
I tugged at my arm, but I didn't even budge a little. I could hear the high-pitched fear in my voice as I complained. Let me go, fucker! I'm gonna call the... Click. Scrape. As it turned loose in my arm and then put the hand against the side of my head. Sleep. I tried to pull away, but it was too late. The moment the rubber glove touched my temple, I could already feel myself fading away. I disappeared into the black. I woke up to the sound of my phone buzzing on the porch. I was laying just inside the front door, which was standing open, morning sunlight pouring in as I tried to understand why I was on the floor and what was going on. Last night, had people come and messed with the old lady next door, or was that a dream? My phone buzzed again as I sat up, and crawling forward, I picked it up to see if it was Aunt Nancy calling. Hey, Brian, I hope I didn't wake you. Getting to my feet, I shut the door. I had a moment of panic, wondering if the cats could have gotten outside. Walking quickly through the house, looking for them, I tried to keep the worry out of my voice. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I'm awake. Oh, good. How are the babies doing? I stepped into Nancy and Jack's bedroom to find the cats curled up together, sleeping on the bed. They're fine. Sleeping at the moment. Puffing out a quiet sigh of relief, I went back into the living room and sat down. I considered telling my aunt about the night before, but I was still half convinced that it must have been some kind of sleepwalking nightmare strange as that sounded in my head, so instead I just asked how things were going at the hospital. Well enough. They think your uncle has a mild secondary infection, but they've started him on antibiotics and he's doing good. I was calling to ask if you bring my tablet when you come by today, if you have time. My paperback and puzzle books from the gift shop are wearing thin. Rubbing my eyes, I nodded to the empty room. Sure, yeah. I'll be up there after a while. I found myself looking out the window at Gladys' house. I just need to check on something first. I could hear blood in my ears as I walked over to Gladys' house. My eyes scanning for signs of a disturbance or danger. There was none. In fact, everything looked better than I remembered it. Wasn't the railing flaking paint before? Hadn't the whole house looked a bit shabby and run down? Not now. Everything looked fresh and clean as though someone had come in overnight and... I swallowed and tried to push away the thought. It had just been a nightmare and maybe I hadn't paid enough attention to how the house really looked before. Jaw clenched. I knocked on the front door. I didn't recognize the woman that answered. She looked like she was in her thirties and was beautiful enough that I felt a new nervousness crowding in with my anxiety and fear. Must be Gladys' daughter or granddaughter or... Can I help you? She smiled at me, her brown eyes twinkling. Um, I... I was looking for Gladys? Her smile widened. (laughs) I'm Gladys. Why are you looking for me? I frowned. No, uh, I mean the old, uh, the elderly lady that lives here. Are you her granddaughter, or... I trailed off as the woman shook her head. There's no one else here but me, she laughed, her voice sounding rich and musical as she stepped back a little. Well, me and my little dog Trudy. The woman cocked her head at me. I think maybe you have the wrong place, but if you want to come in, I can help you figure out where you want to go. Without waiting for an answer, she turned and walked in, beckoning me to follow. I stepped in, my heart hammering. This was all wrong, but how and why? There was no way I would just imagined Nancy and Jack's older neighbor, and I didn't have the wrong house either. And this woman, while beautiful and friendly, was also strange. Aside from what she was saying, she also dressed up in a sundress and wedge heels like she was about to step out to a garden party. 
Maybe she was, but if that was the case, why was she wasting time inviting some strange dude into her house? We went to the living room and I followed her invitation to sit down. I was scared, but also driven to find out what was actually going on. Was I crazy, or was it everything else that was off? Crossing her legs, the woman that called herself Gladys smoothed out her skirt and grinned at me. So, you say you knew another woman, an older woman, that lived here named Gladys? What a coincidence. How long ago was that? I frowned. Um, it was yesterday. I met her yesterday. She giggled. <laughs> You're playing a joke on me. Winking, she leaned forward. Go on, tell me the truth. I won't be mad. I felt an anger stirring in my chest. I'm not joking, or lying, or crazy. I shook my head. An old woman lived here yesterday. Eyes widening, I started pointing around the room. Look at this stuff. This all looks like an old person's house. It looks like my aunt and uncle's house. My gaze found a lamp near the window. That light. I saw that light through my window. This is her house. Gladys. The other Gladys, I mean. The woman had listened intently, her mouth quirking into a smirk at the end. Have you been spying on me, Brian? Not that I mind, but... I leaned back, my scalp prickling. I didn't tell you my name was Brian. I was about to say more when a scrabbling sound erupted behind me, causing me to jump to my feet. What the fuck was that? She chuckled. <laughs> That's just Trudy. She loves to get into the walls and go hunting. The woman wiggled her foot in my direction. If you don't like it over there, you can always come sit over here with me. My eyes were fixed on her foot more than her words. The smooth golden skin there didn't curve away to the hidden sole of the foot that rested against the shoe. Instead, it curved, it flowed slightly inward before going out to make the shoe itself, as though the woman and the shoe had all been made of the same. When I looked up, the woman met my eyes. You like what you see, Brian? Swallowing, I forced myself to smile. Uh, sh sure, I, um, can, can I get some water, please? She watched me for a moment before nodding and standing gracefully. Sure thing. Be right back. Quirking an eyebrow at me, she headed toward what I guessed was the kitchen. She added, Don't go anywhere. As soon as she was out of sight, I headed for the front door. I didn't know who or what she was, but I was getting out of there and calling the fucking cops and... I froze as I heard a moan from behind a door in the hallway. I needed to leave, but what if that was Gladys and she was hurt? Maybe this crazy woman with the fucked up feet had home invaded her or something. Grimacing, I twisted the knob to the hallway door and opened it, glancing inside before stepping in and closing the door behind me. It was a bathroom. Just a large, normal-looking bathroom with a sink and a toilet and a claw-footed tub on one end with a shower. And that's where more moans were coming from. Again, I had to fight the urge to just run, but I'd come this far, and if I left without checking, I'd never forgive myself. Heart in my throat, I crept over to the tub and pulled back the curtain. I... What I saw at first was the pink and the red. Just an uneven surface of those colors with bits of white and black dotting it here and there, like the landscape of some alien planet. My brain didn't want to recognize the details at first. I see the black nose and pleading eyes of Trudy melted into the congealed flesh and blood and bone and possibly pooled in the tub but still alive. I didn't want to hear 
hear the voice of Gladys, the real Gladys, as she whispered to me from a ruined face half submerged in the gelatinous biomass that was all that was left of her and her little dog. Tears sprang to my eyes as my stomach rolled. This was impossible. What had they done to them? Fucking how? Leaning down, I stifled a gag at the rolling hot stench that rose up to meet me. I'll, I'll help you. I knew it was a lie as I whispered. I knew that there was no possible help for this, but I felt like I had to say it anyway. I... I'll come back for you. Glass's milky eyes widened. No. Just get... away. There was a knock on the door, and when I heard the woman's voice on the other side, my stomach clenched painfully. You in there? I've got your water for you. Got more than that if you just come on out. Looking around, I picked up the lid from the back of the toilet before sitting back down. The window, if it wasn't painted shut, I could get out without having to fight my way free. Just a minute. Almost done in here. There was a slam from the other side that made the door jump in its hinges. Hurry up. It's getting lonely out here. I flipped the window latch and was about to ease the sash up when something small and pink burst from the wall over the top. I barely dodged it, letting out a scream as it scuttled down the far wall and crawled under the corner laundry hamper. The fast-moving glimpse I'd seen was all teeth and tails with six legs that bent more than they should as it skittered around in the dark. I hope you don't mind, but I sent little Trudy to roust you out. So to punctuate the thought, I heard a low hissing followed by a harmony of machine gun rattles from under the hamper. Skin crawling with disgust and terror, I yanked up to the window sash. It didn't budge. Fuck this. Turning, I picked up the toilet lid again and slammed it through the window, raking it around once before climbing out. I felt sure that one or both of the monsters inside would bite or grab me before I escaped, but they never did, and when I ran to my car, I nearly wept with relief at realizing I'd never taken the keys out of my pocket the night before. I drove to the hospital slowly, my hands shaking too badly to risk too much speed. I wanted to call the police, but I didn't know what to say that they'd believe me. And given what my aunt had seemed to know about the truck, I felt like talking to her first would be better. So I went up to the cardiac floor and stepped into their room. Jack was asleep in his bed while Nancy was watching some talk show with a bored expression. Her face lit up when she saw me, but then quickly turned to a concerned frown. What's wrong? I glanced at my uncle and then beckoned for her to follow me outside. Maybe we should go down to the cafeteria or something. Talk there. Nodding, she got up and after giving Jack another glance, she went with me. Once we were downstairs, I told her everything that had happened. I tried to stay calm while I talked and I repeatedly expressed how I knew it sounded crazy but I wasn't on drugs or anything. In my surprise, she listened to all of it. It wasn't until the end when I was spent and to the point of questioning her about the mosquito truck that she favored me with a frown. Brian, I've just heard the stuff they spray is bad for you. It's insecticide, right? I don't want to be out in that. My eyes narrowed and I could hear my voice harder when I spoke next. I don't think you're telling the truth. The way you warned me, and then everything else that happened? I don't see how that's a coincidence. She cleared her throat and looked uncomfortable. That's the thing. I listened to what you had to say, but well, Brian, you have to know that that's not true. I 
thought at first you were just telling me a joke or playing a prank, but I can tell you actually believe it, and well, I don't think you'd use drugs, but if it's not that, honey, either you had a really bad dream or you need some kind of help, that's, that's not normal. I held a fresh cut on the side of my palm. Is this a dream? Because I got it, climbing out of the... F getting out of that house of monsters an hour ago. When she just stared at me wordlessly, I shook my head. Fine. If you don't believe me or you won't be honest about what you know, I'll just call the cops. They'll think I'm crazy too, but at least I can try. I winced as Nancy suddenly reached forward, gripping my hand, her voice a low, urgent whisper. No. You can't. There won't be any proof if you do, and if you make a fuss, they'll just come for you sooner. Who? What is all this? She turned and looked out the window, her lips trembling in the early afternoon light. They... I think they've been coming for months, looking for people that are outside and vulnerable. I don't think they can come in unless they catch you outside first. What are they doing to people? A tear rolled down her cheek. Taking them? Replacing them? I don't... I don't really know. I know things are changing. People are changing, but I have trouble really knowing it. Really remembering it. I think it's only because I've been away a while that... Well... You saying all this is helping me remember a bit more. She turned to me, eyes wide, as she gripped my hand tighter. Brian, I never would have let you come if I'd actually remembered. They... they do something to you, keep you from remembering them and what they've changed. Even now, it's hard for me to say what's changed on the street, who's been replaced. It's like trying to think about an old dream. I squeezed her hand back. I... Well, I don't understand, but I, I believe you. But you and Uncle Jack can't go back there. I'll call Mom and... My voice faded as I noticed something under my fingertips. It was Nancy's wedding ring, or... Where that ring would be. I knew that ring. It was silver, and it had been my great-grandmother's. My mother and Nancy had a running joke that Nancy was the only one with small enough hands to wear it, and it was actually too loose on her. But this ring wasn't loose, and it wasn't silver. It was tight against her ring finger, almost like it was grown into it. And it was a single circle of brown ivory, the tint and texture of rotting bone. Looking up, I saw the sadness in Nancy's eyes. They don't replace everyone all at once. I think some of us, they do a little bit at a time. They called me outside a couple months ago, and I'm still mostly myself. She sniffled and looked away, but just mostly. I can tell I feel stronger like I did 15, 20 years ago. And my thoughts have grown strange. I pulled my hand back. Strange how. A fresh pair of tears welled at the corner of her eyes. Like locking Jack outside the other night, for one thing. He was so scared. The poor thing. He had a heart attack. Putting you in danger for another, but that's... That's only part of it. They don't think like we do. And the more I change, the more I see how terribly insane they are. Her red-rimmed eyes found mine again. Insane. And sly. Terribly, terribly sly. Leaning forward, she went on. They hide in the dark of our minds, you see. In the shadowy parts of the world we ignore or can't see. Changing things, corrupting things right under our noses. Because they know we can't be fooled so easily. She shook her head. But it doesn't matter. 
You need to go now. I stared at her in surprise. Go. I'm not going without the two of you. I'll go get the cats, get a hotel room, and then we can find you all a new place to... The hospital. It's really old. Did you know that? I blinked. Uh, no. She nodded. It is. It looks new, and most of it is new, but the main building has been here over a hundred years. They just add to it and take away from it. It's like an ocean eating a beach, I guess. Every time the tide turns, it adds more new and takes away some old. Okay, but what does... And in the bottom of the old is the boiler room. I know, because our father, your grandfather, worked there as a maintenance man back in the 50s. They don't even use the boiler room anymore, but that room is still there, at least for now. Until it gets replaced, too. Frowning, I leaned forward. Aunt Nancy, I don't understand why you're telling me all this. When she smiled at me then, her jaw was clenched hard enough to make her cheek jump. I'm telling you this because I'm like the hospital. Jack will be soon, too. Less and less myself as time goes on. Okay. I get what you're saying, but we can... And because the entire time we've been sitting here, I've been fighting the urge to grab you by your thin neck and drag you down into that boiler room. Pour out the treatment upon you and watch your flesh be inured into the soil for something new and wonderful. Her entire face was twitching now and a thin line of drool stretched out from the corner of her lip as she stared at me. Part of me wants you to stay because soon I'll give in and no one will stop me. They won't even notice as I drag you away, crying and screaming into the old heart of this place. And then, ooh, the things that I'll do to you when you're down there. The things I show your flesh will be nothing compared to what I do to your soul. She gripped the table hard enough to make it creak as she put her head down with a sob. Please, you need to run now. Trembling, I stood up gingerly and backed away from the table. By the time I was at the edge of the cafeteria's carpet, I was running for the door. I like to say I went back later to help them, that I found a way to help them, to get them away from that place, or get them back to themselves. But I didn't. Only some of it was out of cowardice. The rest was that... By the time I was driving away and calling my mother, I was already forgetting it all. I was so determined to tell her to warn her about what had happened to her sister, but by the time she picked up, I was just telling her I had to leave Aunt Nancy's a bit early. I never went back for my stuff, not even my laptop, and I had to get a month extension on my paper since I had to start largely from scratch, but even that didn't seem strange to me. I just lost it somewhere, the same way I'd fallen out of touch with my aunt and uncle, and in time, with my own parents, too. That all started three years ago, and it wasn't until last night that I remembered any of it. I'd been asleep when I heard a noise, a new and alien noise that didn't belong in my quiet subdivision after dark. I looked at my phone and saw it was 103, and even as I got up and looked out the window, I didn't understand the terrible fear I was tightening in my chest. That's when I saw the mosquito truck rumbling outside. Everything hit me at once, and I let out a cry as my knees buckled, and I felt the air around me grow thin. I remembered everything now now that it was too late to do anything about it. Gasping for air, I crawled through the house, terrified of seeing a mask at the window or hearing something coming for me from inside the walls. I just had to make sure. I just had to make sure. And it would all be okay, at least for now. After what seemed like forever, I made it to the front door and reached up. I let out a sob of relief when I felt that the deadbolt was thrown. Outside, the truck prowled away into the night. 
patient, hungry, and terribly, terribly sly. Hey, I hope you're having a wonderful time listening tonight, but did you know that it would be even better if you had some snacks to go with it? If you would like some snacks, check out the link in the top of the description. It'll take you to Universal Yums. For just $15, you can order a box full of snacks from a different country around the world. I've gotten some from Spain, Mexico, Russia, Italy, all over the place, and they never disappoint. They have sweet and savory snacks. They make great gifts. And again, it's only 15 bucks, and you can cancel your subscription anytime. Check out the link at the top of the description, help out the channel, and get you some snacks. Take care, everyone. Small trigger warning before we get into tonight's second and final story. There is some depiction of self-harm on a kind of extreme level. Um, if that's something you're uncomfortable with, feel free to set this one out. There are tons of other stories that you can go and listen to on the channel right now. Just wanted to let everyone know before we get into this that there is some depiction of self-harm. So, like I said, if you want to set this one out, totally understandable. Take care, everyone. I'm not just some crazy girl. You'll believe me if you just take a moment and see the leech the way I saw it. I know you will. Just listen. It started when I was in Japan. I've been living with a host family for a few months and my semester abroad was almost over. I had the nerve to believe I'd begun to acclimate, that I understood their culture and could call myself one of them. On more than a few nights gathered around the fire, they told me their superstitions and scary stories. Their myths were very different from the ones I'd grown up with, and I found them fascinating, but not scary. They were too different. There was a heavy emphasis on choice. Rather than facing a mindless slasher that simply wanted to kill you, many Japanese horror stories involved entities approaching an unwary victim in a public place and giving them a choice. If the victim answered one way, they would be killed horribly in a specific manner. If the victim took the other choice, they would be killed horribly in another specific manner. These unwinnable situations made me laugh until the father of my host family explained to me in quiet tones the true subtext. It was all about the third option. It was all about the innate fear of customs in a very traditional society. The only way to survive was to simply know the acceptable third answer and give that one instead. He squeezed my arm and told me that I, as a foreigner, stood no chance of knowing the third answer. If I saw someone approaching me in public, no matter how innocent it seemed, I was to run away before they could speak and give me that fatal choice. I smiled and laughed it off, but his warning made me shiver a few times over my last few days. As a girl alone in another country, I was already on guard while walking through public spaces, but the towering maze of Tokyo took on a gray and tense tone whenever I thought of what might lurk among the crowds. I stuck to the paths that went through the many hidden gardens and parks, and I always looked around warily. That fear faded, though. I can't tell you why, not exactly. I was young. I thought I was smart, and I was American. Nothing could really hurt me. And besides, I was one of them now, right? I had spent months there, living like they did. So on my last day, when a woman began walking intently toward me from the opposite end of a long subway car, I stayed in my seat. She had long black hair, 
beautiful dark eyes, and a dark green dress that seemed out of place in a crowded car, otherwise filled with gray shirts, dark suits, and white blouses. I saw these details about her before. I saw the deep scars on her face and hands, as if a maniacal American slasher had brutally carved her up and left her to die some years ago. As she shuffled toward me, the lights flickered once. The boy in the seat next to me shivered and focused worriedly on his portable game. Adults looked away, tense, and teenagers opposite me finally stopped talking and began staring at their shoes. They knew. They knew, and there was nothing any of them could or would do for me. I was a foreigner and a stranger to them. But they listened. (laughs) Oh, did they listen. I could almost hear them straining their ears to hear the whispers over the keening wheels on rails beneath us. Every small step the woman took seemed louder than the one before. Even then, I didn't believe it. I thought it was a prank or someone just being strange. I thought the others in the car with me were turning away out of courtesy or disgust at her scars. When I saw a tear fall from the cheek to the boy next to me, when I saw it splatter onto his game screen while he continued to pretend to play, that was when I understood. She stood directly above me, and I raised my eyes to meet hers. Her scars crinkled horribly as she gave me a seemingly innocent smile and she asked in a pleasant but whispery voice, Do you have a sister? I froze. If I said yes, what would happen? But if I said no, what else would happen? When the lights flickered again and her face moved without moving right down close to mine, I almost panicked and told her the truth. Inches away from me, her smile widened. She turned her head slowly, horribly slowly, until her neck reached a 90 degree angle. On the verge of passing out from fright, I forced myself to start breathing again. Her smile turned into an angry frown. I cowered back against the person behind me who shrieked. The scarred woman in green began to reach for me, but the car came to a smooth stop. The doors opened, and I dodged around her and ran out with the crowd. To their credits, none screamed. They simply hurried off to their various destinations while attempting to seem like nothing was wrong. Nobody wanted to draw attention to themselves. Nobody wanted to get noticed by the woman in green or by a polite society. I ran all the way to my host family's house, but nobody was home. It was my last day, and we'd already said our goodbyes, but it still felt odd that they were gone. Still trembling, I took a taxi to the airport, made my flight, and tried to rationalize the encounter away. The only hint I had that it ever even happened was a small cut on my upper arm where she nearly grabs me with her horribly long nails. A cut that had already, strangely, begun to heal into a scar. Hours into my international flight, I finally began to calm down, and I even started feeling a bit smug. Not only had I survived an encounter with a Japanese horror entity, I'd even managed to immediately take a flight straight the hell out of the entire country. I would not end up as another unwitting cautionary tale. I was a born and bred American girl that had seen every horror movie under the sun, and I'd made all the right decisions. Awesome. I told the story to a guy sitting next to me on my flight, and he asked, What if she shows up here on the plane? Where will you run? Yeah. I shut up right about then, and stayed tense for the next few hours. 
Eventually, though, I realized I'd be doomed no matter what if the woman in the green dress showed up here, so I finally gave in and slept. Awake or asleep, it didn't matter. My neighboring guy woke me up before we landed, joked that he'd kept guard, and reported that nobody had come for me while I'd been out. Half-heartedly thanking him, I made polite conversation, left the plane, got my stuff, and met my parents outside the airport. It was bright, sunny, and open here, and it was a relief to be back home. This was the land of simple horrors, of gory violence, zombies, and haunted locations. The scarred woman in the green dress would have no power here, if indeed she'd existed at all. I was talkative and happy on the ride home, and my parents were glad to see me. I didn't tell them about my horrible encounter because it honestly slipped from my mind. Everything was good. I was safe. We pulled up to the house where I'd grown up, and it looked exactly like I'd remembered. Only a few months had gone by, true, but it felt like a lifetime. Lodging in my stuff alongside my dad, I began to recount some funny memory that had come to mind. When he entered the front door, I turned toward the kitchen and saw her standing there. Green dress, scars, smile and all, the woman from the subway car thousands of miles distant stood waiting for me in my childhood home. She gave that same eerie smile and lifted a large knife. I screamed and dropped my bag, startled my father, dropped his too, and my mother rushed in from outside. The woman in green brought the knife down. She raised it and then brought it down again, chopping vegetables. Mistaking my reaction, my mother began screaming with me, but happily, and she pulled me forward. It's good to see your sister again, isn't it? Suddenly, I was forced into a hug with both my mom and the woman in green, but instead of trying to hurt me, the horrible stranger just smiled. It's good to see you, sis. I pulled away, trembling forcefully. I immediately sensed that that something was off, and I'd seen enough movies to know how to keep my cards close to my chest. Mom, what is going on? What do you mean, honey? She asked, smiling happily at both of us before moving deeper into the kitchen to help cook. The scarred woman in green kept her gaze and neutral smile fixated on me as I moved away from her around the kitchen island and toward my mom. Why is she here? Who? Her. I returned the woman's stare. My mother laughed. <laughs> You've been away too long, dear. You remember that your sister's graduated and back from college now? I gulped. Humor me, Mom. Why doesn't she look like us? My father came down the stairs, returning from dropping off my bags, and gave me a black look. I thought we were past this. It's not nice to keep harping on your sister for being adopted. Horrified, I took a step back and bumped into the fridge. But how? Oh, I guess I'm just super jet lagged. Sorry, I was just trying to remember when that was. For a birthday present for her and all. My father sighed. <sighs> Same day you were born. He stepped out to get more bags from the car. I turned away, mortified. My sister never took her gaze off me, almost taunting me with her expressionless invasion. As we both stood there facing off silently, she lifted her knife and brought it down on her own arm right along one of her scars. She didn't flinch. 
Instead, I did. Gripping my arm and looking down, I saw the skin slice, open, bleed, heal, and fade into a scar in moments. Aghast, I looked at her and saw the equivalent cut disappearing from her arm. Her smile grew a little wider. I opened my mouth to scream something with fury, but the scarred woman lifted a knife and pointed it at my mother's back. The implication was clear. The best I could do was to take the knife from her by offering to cook and insisting that my sister sit down at the table and relax. She did so, apparently willing to play a social game of cat and mouse. As I chopped up vegetables and stared at the scar on my arm, my thoughts raced. This entity had somehow attached itself to my life. Looking around at pictures in the kitchen, I saw her in photographs that I recognized. Family photos that now included her as a child, as a teenager, as a woman, scarred from the outset. I kept my eyes on her as she sat at the table, and she stared right back at me the entire time. Her disfigured smile never once changed. We actually sat down and had dinner as a family. My parents didn't seem to notice that my sister never spoke unless directly addressed, and even then only with perfect politeness. She ate a little and kept her eyes always on me. Halfway through dinner, I got angry and slammed my fist on the table. She took her dinner knife and drew it across her cheek. I fought hard not to scream as I felt my face split open, bleed, and then heal. I already knew there would be a scar, but I excused myself to go to the bathroom and look for myself. Once there, it occurred to me that the leech, a leech on my life, time, and soul, seemed to be punishing me for rudeness. I remember saying to the mirror, All right, you bitch. I'll play your game. I just needed time to figure out Another slice opened up near my ear, bled, and quickly healed over into a scar. She'd heard me from the dining room. Or she could hear me no matter what. Walking carefully back to the dining room, I put on my best graces and sat with a smile. I couldn't think about the scars. Were they permanent? Would I live the rest of my life disfigured? Plastic surgery might fix a few, but if this kept going... No. I would just have to be polite and proper until I could figure out how to destroy her. I volunteered to help clean up dinner and do the dishes, and my mother seemed surprised, saying that my time in Japan had done me good. I didn't know what she meant by that, but I managed to get through the evening without any further scars. That night, I tried to whisper to my father in the dark, but he didn't understand what I meant, and I earned another scar on my arm. I slipped downstairs and into her room. My sister sat holding a knife to her arm and grinning wider than I'd ever seen. What do you want? I asked her. She held the knife higher on her arm, just above a clear patch of skin where her scars had left her and been transferred to me. Do you have a sister? Suddenly remembering that moment of mortal threat in the subway car, I, I said nothing. She did not cut herself. She did wait, always staring, ever staring. I backed out and went to my own bedroom where I lay stressed for hours. I did sleep eventually, but only because jet lag forced me into it. The next few days were filled with terribly costly chess moves. I invited over old friends to see if they recognized her as my sister. And they did. For each of these conversations with confused friends, I earned another scar. The leech knew what I was trying to do, and she disapproved. 
The worst part was running into an ex-boyfriend and finding out that he didn't remember our relationship. After much pressure, he finally admitted, I liked your personality, but I didn't ask you out. Because of your scars. Sorry. I remember screaming and earning another scar for it. Rushing home, I looked at my old yearbook pictures. The scars weren't just appearing now, they were appearing back then too. I'd always had them. That same ex-boyfriend would later remember asking out my sister instead. The leech was draining away my life right before my eyes. What would happen when she ran out of scars and I had them all? I couldn't talk to my parents. I couldn't talk to my friends. I shut myself in my room and spent each day alone to avoid any further social improprieties. I've been raised American, raised rude, proud, and free, and I kept making mistakes. It was in me to swear, to nettle, to tease, and the cost was just too high. My host family's father had been right. I was losing because I was from the wrong culture. Had I been a traditional and proper Japanese girl, the leech might have never punished me even once. The leech existed to punish deviants. The leech fed off outsiders, rebels, and bad children. The leech... The leech was part of me now. She only had a few scars when the idea came to me. She had this huge, asinine grin all the time now, and she stood in my room while I slept, staring at me, basically daring me to say something rude. She held a knife over me while I slept, yes, but it was not to cut me. It was to cut herself. And that's what gave me the idea. Furious and desperate beyond description, I decided that I wanted my life back at any cost. I've been thinking of the leech in two ways. I could avoid being rude and live under her threat for the rest of my life, or I could be myself and find out what punishment awaited once all the scars had been inflicted upon me. I feared that second option. I was terrified. When the leech became clear and beautiful and I became horrid and misshapen, what would she do to me? Would she kill me? Discard me when I stopped being useful? Would I cease to exist altogether? Would my life completely become hers? I'd been so afraid of that second option. It took me until she only had one scar left to remember what my benefactor had said. There was a third option, one unknowable to any but the most socially integrated, and I had enough time to see that. For the leech, the social game went both ways. We were not in Japan. We were in America. Here, victims got tough when the end was nigh. She was with me always then. She walked directly behind me, goading me, irritating me, pushing me with her silence and her grin. (laughs) That perfect smile on that beautiful face, it mocked me. I stood in the kitchen with her, and I drew out the same knife she'd been holding when I'd first come home, and found her attached to my life and timeline like the horrific leech that she was. I smiled at her matching her expression, and I brought the knife down before she could react. Not on her. On myself. I slashed open my arm, and blood splattered across the kitchen island. She gasped and pulled back, her hair hiding her face. I saw her clutch her arm, and I saw a scar appear in the equivalent place and where I'd slashed myself. I wasn't healing, but I'd actually managed to injure her. I'd thought long and hard about it. Cutting her would only mean cutting myself, but cutting myself meant cutting her. I slashed again, this time on my face. She screamed. Finally, God, 
I had longed, prayed to hear that noise from her. I slashed again on my leg and she fell to her knees. My blood splattered across her green dress, soiling it, and I slashed myself again and again and again. I felt faint, and still I cut myself, turning my arms, legs, face, and tummy into an oozing mince meat and gobs of flesh. With each strike, she screamed louder and crumpled further. I fell to my knees before her, a wall of pain and ebbing gore, and I smiled at her as her scream reached a crescendo that soared into nothingness. With a last gasp, she shrank and blackened until she became nothing more than a grasping little animal, an actual leech. Without a person to latch on to, she was nothing but a worm. With the last of my strength, I stood up and stomped her. It was over. I called 911 after that, of course. And equally as expected, you think I'm crazy, but you have to listen. She was real, but she's gone now, and I'm not going to do this again. I killed her. I know I'll be scarred all over just like she was, but at least I'll get to live. I'll get to swear. I'll get to drink. I'll get to... <laughs> Remorse? For what? Why are you asking me that question? Find the guy on the plane. He'll tell you what I told him. There's no way he'd forget. <laughs> You're not hearing me. Find anyone who was on the subway that day in my car. They'll tell you. <laughs> Why do you keep saying that? Stop asking me that question. She was a leech. She took everything that should have been mine. If she just never been adopted, it would have been my life. They would have been my friends, my boyfriends, my prom date. She was always there. Always in my goddamn house. Always so much better than me. Always mocking me with that beautiful face. I don't have a sister. It might surprise you to know that witches actually hate Halloween. Witches are generally very quiet, introverted creatures. So the screaming children pounding on our doors and demanding candy? That just isn't really our style. The little witch costumes are always kind of cute, though. It's nice to be a role model just for one night. Vampires, on the other hand, love Halloween. Kids aren't usually out after dark, except for on this one night, and so vampires crawl out of their hovels, or their crummy downtown flats, to ooh and ah over the little children and their costumes. I can tell you're tense already just thinking about that. Well, don't worry. Our kind have a pact for Halloween. We don't touch children. Because of the nature of some of our population, we can't guarantee that children will always be safe. But on this one night, we make sure the kids can come out and have a good time without fear of losing a limb or worse. We're not the monsters you think we are. Well, at least not always, anyway. So, that Halloween night, I found myself sitting in my living room, studying from the anatomy of white magic, drinking some Da Hong Pao black tea sent to me from my cousin across town. I was finally totally relaxed after what had amounted to a long, hellish week, and was really enjoying myself when I heard a scraping at the window. I saw a shock of blonde hair outside the glass and had to suppress an eye roll. I absolutely wasn't in the mood to be toyed with that night, but I rose to my feet and stalked over to the window, throwing it open with a dramatic flick of my wrist. The creature outside my window clapped as though the very sight of me inspired awe. Hey, sweetheart. Invite me in. He purred, his voice deep and smooth and hypnotic. Don't call me sweetheart, I deadpanned, crossing my arms over my chest. Jeez, fine. You can be such a hard ass, he 
he said, irritation showing in his voice. I could tell it rankled him that his seductive powers had no effect on me. Come on, just let me in. I really need to talk to you. Is it about Halloween? I asked. It is about Halloween, and it's very important. I stared at him with pursed lips for a second. When people think of vampires, they generally think of tall, pale, dark hair, brooding, that kind of thing. Honestly, I blame Dracula. Bram Stoker was such a drama queen. The man before me was none of those things. He had sandy blonde hair and a deep tan, flashing blue eyes, and blindingly white teeth. He was a real beach boy aesthetic. (laughs) And they call this guy a creature of the night. I scoffed. Vampires get all the good literature. I uncrossed my arms and said, Fine. Come in, Gail. He climbed in through the window and landed lightly on his feet, smiling at me. Smirking, more like it. I always knew I'd get inside your house one day. Seriously, what do you want? I'm having a perfectly lovely night and I don't need you here to ruin it. Oh, you wound me. He clutched his heart and threw his other hand over his eyes as though about to faint. My lips twitched, but I forced back a smile. Come on, just spill it. You said it was important. He sighed. (laughs) You're no fun, you know? Then he became serious. We have a problem down on the east side of the city. What do you mean? At least four kids have gone missing. They were trick-or-treating together. I ran into their parents, who were pretty frantic with worry. It could be nothing, but I have a feeling that somebody has taken them. Do you have anything to base this feeling on? I asked. He shrugged. No, but it's a pretty bad feeling. I'm going to go look for them. I'd appreciate if you helped me out. I gazed longingly at my tea and my book. I'd really much rather have stayed inside, but Gail was only 200 years old. He was still finding his feet as a vampire, and it would be just like him to run off and do something stupid and get in totally over his head. And then I'd have to deal with the fallout. At least that's what I told myself. So I'd have an excuse to say yes. I heaved a put-upon sigh. (sighs) Fine, fine. Let me get my coat. And shut the window. We're going through the door like civilized people. I turned to grab my coat, then thought better of it. I ran to the closet near the foyer and pulled out a black cloak, a bag, a pointed hat, and a broom. I heard Gail muffling laughter behind his hand. (laughs) Wow, are you for real right now? It's Halloween, I shrugged. Might as well look the part. I didn't wait to hear any of his other comments before stalking out the door in search of whoever was ruining my night. It only took me a moment to get us to the other side of town. Witches have a lot of ways of getting around. My favorite method is to manipulate reality, melt the reality we exist in, and transfer to a reality where I'm at my target destination, and then merge the two reality strands. Sci-fi fans would like you to believe that this is dangerous, but their fears are vastly overstated. There's nothing so mundane and easy to manipulate as time. Gale, however, was not nearly so used to this sort of magic. He crouched down with his hands, clutching his head when we stopped. What's wrong? Feeling a bit queasy, are we? I asked. I was glad I'd chosen a secluded area as my destination. That way nobody would bother us to ask if he was okay. How do you do that and not vomit every time? Seriously. He looked pale as he focused on taking deep breaths. I waited patiently as he calmed himself down. We were back on the move five minutes later, watching all the children running around, giggling and screaming. Look, Mom, it's a witch! A real witch! shrieked a little girl. 
She had a sparkly purple tutu, a pointed hat, and a very ornate wand that I surmised she'd painted herself. I see that, sweetie, said her mother. She winked at me and I laughed. Hey, you're good with kids, said Gail as we turned down a side street. There were fewer kids the further we moved, even though this part of town was pretty densely populated. You sound surprised. My voice was dry, and I was shocked to find myself a little offended. I just never knew you liked him, is all. I could get you one, if you want. He waggled his eyebrows at me, and I gave him a look of total disgust. Not like that, I just... Swipe one. You're just making it worse, I mumbled, pointedly ignoring him. He grabbed my arm and pointed at the end of the street. There was a group of parents speaking to some police officers. That must be why the trick-or-treaters are staying away from here, I thought. Let me get a little closer. I'll see if I can hear what they're saying, said Gail, slinking off down the street, hiding in the shadows of the buildings. Don't get caught, I hissed. I stood there awkwardly in the dark, wondering if I should have followed him. I was beginning to feel nervous for absolutely no reason at all. I wondered if it was a premonition. No, that can't be it, I thought. Gail just got his panties in a bunch over nothing. Hell, the cops will probably find those kids before we do. Maybe they just snuck off into the woods or something. Gail reappeared next to me while I was lost in thought, and I just about shrieked. Don't. Do that, I said. He grinned at me. I knew I could get you. I heard the parents say the kids disappeared while they were on J Street. The parents took their eyes off them, and when they turned around, the kids were gone. Jeez. How can they just let their kids out of their sights on Halloween? I mumbled in irritation. It's like they want them to get killed. Oh, we might as well head down J Street. Keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Don't worry, I'll sniff them out, Gail replied. I shuddered a little at that. It's true. Vampires have very keen senses, and his super hearing or super smelling might turn out to be useful in such a situation. But it was still weird and grossed me out. Unnatural, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm one to talk. As we headed towards J Street, Gail asked... What will the association do if it's one of us? The association is... hard to explain. It's sort of like our version of government. It's a bit less restrictive, I guess. They don't have many rules. It's just that the rules they do have are very, very important. You really don't want to break them. Trust me. Well... There will be an investigation, I'm sure. Once the association makes a decision, I guess it would be like death. Gail paled. You mean like permanent death? Yep. I was sort of enjoying watching him squirm. So you better watch yourself. One misstep and you could have a blessed wooden stake right through your heart glared at me. That is not funny. He stopped short just as we stepped onto J Street. He lifted his head and took a long sniff like some kind of hunting dog. I could just picture him with the ears and the tail. It was actually a cute thought. Oh no. Oh no. I shook my head to clear it of that horrifying vision just as he looked at me with excitement. I could smell it. They're here. I know it's them. What do you smell? Blood. Shit. Is it a lot of blood? I mean, the smell is pretty strong, so there must be a significant... Oh. His grin faded after he realized the implication of what he was saying. Well, maybe it isn't them after all. Can you take me to the source? He nodded and started down the street with renewed vigor. So are you going to tell me your real name? Gail asked. 
Nope. Gail frowned at me. Come on, we're friends. Nothing doing. Surely you don't want me to call you Ambrosia forever. I grimaced. Ambrosia is the name given to me by the Council of Witchcraft. It's symbolic, but also practical. It binds me to the other witches in our community, and if I were to ever break our code, they could use it to subdue and restrain me. Plus, no witch gives out her real name. Our real names hold unbridled power over us, and to do so could very well mean suicide. But still, Ambrosia? That's got to be one of the worst names in the history of names. Seriously. I'll think about it, I answered. Hey, if you don't want to use that name, why don't you just join a coven instead? No! My voice came out much louder than it needed to be, but seriously, I would never dream of disgracing myself by joining a coven. Covens are for witches who are rejected from the council and who are stuck in the Middle Ages. You know those pictures of witches you see where there's a bunch of old, haggard women covered in boils and eating children? Yeah, those are the kind of crazies you get when you start a coven. <laughs> Hard pass. Hold on, hold on, said Gale, holding up his hand. His head tilted to the left, and he sniffed the air again. It's there. He pointed to a rather large house with the lights off. It didn't look like a super welcoming place. No Halloween decorations, no sign of life. I wonder why the kids walked up to it. Other than the fact that, you know, kids are dumb and tend to do dumb things. All right, let's go in. We made our way up the pathway, and I stooped down in front of the door. After discovering the door was locked, I slipped a bobby pin from my hair and started to jiggle it around the lock. Come on, you don't have some kind of, like, door unlocking spell? Asked Gale. He was bouncing on his feet, eager to find the source of all the blood. Yeah, I don't use magic on something that's stupid. Picking a lock is easier and honestly faster. I heard a click and tried the handle again. This time it turned. Okay, let's go. We entered the house, prepared to search it from bottom to top in order to find the source of the blood. But turns out we didn't have to. We found a body slumped against the wall in the foyer, blood smeared on the walls and pulled on the floor. Gail swore as I knelt down by the child and put my finger to his throat. He was definitely dead, as if the sheer amount of blood loss hadn't already given me my answer. The child couldn't have been more than eight. He'd been wearing a Superman costume that was now torn in the chest. He had multiple stab wounds in his chest cavity and a few in his legs and arms. His eyes were blue and glassy. What do we do? Asked Gail, all traces of his earlier humor gone. First, let's find the others, I said. I stood up and gave the dead kid a pat on the head as though it would comfort him. Not that he really needed it anymore. A few blood drops led us further into the house, past the dining room, and into the kitchen, where we found what appeared to be the basement door ajar. As we approached the door, we could see a light and heard the faint sound of somebody crying. That must be it, I said. I turned to Gail. When we go down there, our primary goal is to get the kids out. Whatever has them, you hold it off while I grab the kids, okay? What do you think this is? He asked. He was trying not to sound worried. Well, he'd used a knife, so I would guess it's a rogue witch or a wizard performing a dark magic ritual. You'll need to be careful, but we have an advantage. They aren't expecting a vampire. He nodded, and I took that as permission to begin my descent. We crept down the stairs as quickly and quietly as we could. The basement slowly came to my field of vision. There were two children, tied and gagged in the far corner of the basement, a spaceman and a pirate. At the other end of the room, there stood a man with his back to us. 
He was holding a young girl against the wall by her left hand. She, too, was gagged. She was dressed like a witch. I saw the man had a knife in his hand, and I realized what was happening the same second Gale did. Holy shit. He's human, isn't he? Gale didn't bother whispering or concealing his voice. Everyone in the room turned to look at it, me included, and I glared. What? He shrugged. This will be a piece of cake, honestly. I looked back at the man and the girl and saw that she was missing a finger on her hand, the man having sliced it off with his knife. My eyes went dark and I saw red. All right, Gale. Kill him. Gale's face went slack and his fangs peeked out from under his lips. He rocked back on his heels and then lunged toward the man. You'll notice that I haven't actually told you what the man looked like. The murderer. There's good reason for that. You see, he was just so... ordinary. When I first laid eyes on him, the scene seemed so absurd to me. He looked like a regular middle-aged, balding salary man. There was nothing sinister about him, nothing that would indicate that he was fucked up, that he liked murdering children. And somehow that scared me more than anything I've ever encountered in our world. And it's something I don't like to think about. So I watched Gale lunge at the man with something akin to relief. As Gale slammed the man into the wall, he dropped the child, and she sat on the ground, sobbing behind her gag. I ran to her and grabbed her, dragging her back to the corner with her friends. I set her down by her friends and started searching the floor frantically. I spotted her finger on the ground and grasped it, bringing it to her. She was pale, hyperventilating, about to enter into shock. I placed her finger back into its rightful place and reached into my bag, grabbing out a handkerchief and a small blue vial. I wrapped the handkerchief around one hand and a finger and breathed over it, mumbling a spell to myself as I did. I poured the blue solution onto her hand and let it soak into the cloth. I waited for a beat or two before removing it. Her finger was reattached and good as new with nothing but a small white scar to show that it had ever been injured. She stared at it in wonder, her breathing evening out. I reached up and pulled her gag off. Hi there, my name's Ambrosia. What's your name? I asked her. She stared at me uncertainly for a moment. Her eyes shifted behind me and I could hear the slurping, sucking sounds Gail was making. No, 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 don't look there. Look at me. Her eyes shifted back and she took a deep breath. Samantha, she said. I smiled at her. That's a beautiful name. Are you a witch, Samantha? She nodded and then shook her head. Well, I'm not a real witch. I'm just pretending. I see. You could have fooled me. You look just like a real witch. Samantha, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to face the wall and not turn around. I'm going to untie you and your friends, and then we're going to go and find your parents. How does that sound? She nodded and turned towards the wall. I slipped the switchblade out of my pocket and cut the ropes off the other children. All right, guys, let's get out of here, shall we? What is he doing to that man? Asked the pirate. I had a very good idea of what Gail was doing, but I decided to avoid that particular topic. You guys don't have to worry about that. That man isn't going to hurt you anymore, and my friend wouldn't dream of hurting you. We want to help you. That means you have to come upstairs with me, alright? The kids nodded, a little hesitant, but still trusting. I couldn't imagine still trusting someone after what they'd seen, but... That's what's magical about kids. I led them upstairs, kept them distracted while we walked by the body of their friend. As we reached the door, I turned around and knelt down. I whispered a few words in each of their ears and watched as their eyes went blank. I ushered them out the door. 
Your parents are down the street waiting for you. Go on now. They walked away in something of a daze. A quick memory wipe will do that to a person. I turned back and looked at the dead child in the foyer. I know what to do with you, I murmured. I stared for a moment and then walked back down to the basement. Gail was kneeling over the body of the murderer, covered in his gore and blood. The man had been eviscerated. His entrails pulled out and spread around the room in disarray. His fingernails had been pulled out and shoved into his eyes. His teeth were scattered all over the floor. <laughs> Dude never had his wisdom teeth taken out, I guess. He was still gurgling and choking on his own blood as I walked over. I could see that Gail had left him alive, at least for the time being. Jeez, could you take any longer? I asked. The man's head jerked towards me, terror written on the lines in his face. I looked away and focused on Gale. Well, after what he did to that other kid, I wasn't going to give him a quick death. Blood dripped from Gale's lips and covered his front. His pupils were so large they overtook the color of his eyes. That happens when they feed. I'm not sure why, but I've always found it enormously attractive. But I found it even more attractive that he was showing self-control to make this son of a bitch suffer. Well, we need to pick up the other kid's body and get out of here. So if you could finish up... He nodded and grasped the man's face in both his hands, straddling his body. He yanked hard and fast. The sound of his flesh distending and snapping was sickening. His body flailed a moment after the decapitation, but it didn't last very long. It was a relief when he stopped moving. I didn't want to think about the world housing that kind of human. Help me grab the kid, will you? We went upstairs and Gale lifted the kid into his arms. He looked at me in confusion. What do you want him for? Don't you think maybe we should just leave him here for the police to find? I shook my head. I can do you one better. I grabbed onto Gale and transported us back to my house. My plan already in place. Remind me why we're doing this again? Gale was sitting on my back porch as I placed the child in a coffin. It's a beautiful coffin. It's made of oak and has intricate carvings all over it. More importantly, it is etched with runes. Thousands of them. I shut the lid and caressed it, reading through some of the runes. I smirked a little at Gale's confusion. He was about to get a first-class show, that's for sure. Are you gonna... I don't know... bury him or something? I just laughed and shook my head. Have you ever heard of necromancy? I recoiled a little. I thought you were a white magic witch, not a... You know. <laughs> Jeez. Necromancy isn't all about black magic. I mean, sure, you can do it that way, but it's a lot harder and it's pretty disgusting. You have to cook and eat a dog and abstain from the sight of women. It's... It's a pain, and the result is distorted. But if you do it while using white magic, well, if you're lucky, it just might work. The results aren't guaranteed, but hey, it's better than nothing. As I spoke, I took off my jacket and rolled up my sleeves. I flexed and stretched my fingers. I didn't want to pull a muscle in my hand with what I was about to do. He looked at me like I was insane. How come I've never heard of this? I shrugged. You're young. There's a lot of things you don't know. Like your phone number. He flashed a smile at me and I shook my head in despair. There is no hope for you. Seriously. With that, I stretched my hands over the coffin. I began to mutter to myself, reciting the runes that graced the lid. My voice fell into an even cadence as I grew louder, the world fading around me in my concentration. On the fifth line, I brought my right hand to my left wrist, feeling for the pulse that beat just below my skin. 
On the tenth line, I plunged a fingernail through my skin and into my artery, letting my blood drench the lid of the coffin. It seeped into the ruined carvings and disappeared while my chanting continued. I could hear other voices joining me now, voices from different times and spaces and existences. I finally recited the final and twentieth line, my strength failing me. I let myself fall forward on the lid of the coffin, my blood still flowing freely from my wrist as I struggled to breathe. I was losing a lot of blood very quickly. If the ritual was going to work, and had to work now. I very vaguely became aware of being lifted off the coffin lid. I realized after a moment that Gale was cradling me, my wrist lifted to his mouth. He was licking my wound, which... I realized, had closed when it came in contact with his saliva. Vampire saliva has many healing properties. Not that I appreciated it at that exact moment. Don't interfere, Gale. It was hard getting enough breath to speak. I'd lost a dangerous amount of blood. You're a goddamn idiot, Ambrosia. Are you trying to kill yourself? You know you could pick a better way to do this than to bleed out in front of a vampire. I have to. The ritual. No ritual is so important that you endanger yourself like that. What the hell were you thinking? A bit of clarity was coming back into my head. I opened my mouth to retort when he and I both heard it. A tentative knock was coming from inside the coffin. Hello? Is anybody there? Gail's jaw dropped, and I struggled out of his arms, wrenching the coffin lid open. The little boy looked at me in terror. His wounds, however, were gone, and the blood had vanished from his costume. I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. It was a victory I never expected. I struggled to help him out of his coffin until Gale took over. I didn't even mind. I was elated. It worked. I couldn't believe it worked. The coffin was a family heirloom, and while I knew of its powers, I never tried to access them before. It takes a perfect specimen. The boy was freshly dead and had a pure, innocent soul. With anyone else, who knows if it might have worked. Furthermore, the ritual is incredibly dangerous, and many witches have died trying to complete it. That night, I could have easily been one of them. We sat the kid down, learned his name, his address. He was confused and didn't remember anything except for being out and about with his friends. He had no memories of his murder, which was good. We didn't have to wipe his memory at all. We told him he hit his head that we'd found him on the sidewalk and brought him to a safe place to see if he was okay. Gail offered to walk him home. It was getting late now, and surely his parents were worried. And so, Gail helped me into my house and sat me down on my chair back with my book and tea. And then he took the boy by his hand and they walked toward the front door. I noticed that Gail had already charmed Charlie, and the two were getting along splendidly. Gail was good with the kids, too. I noted that and filed it away, you know, for future reference. Hey, Ambrosia, are you, uh, busy next Wednesday? He asked me before, opening the door and disappearing into the night. (laughs) I might be, I might not. What do you ask? You, me, dinner. Eight o'clock. Pick you up at 7.30? I thought about it. And then I gave him a laugh. (laughs) We'll see. But no promises. He grinned and gave me a little wave as he ushered Charlie out into the darkness. I watched them go, content in the knowledge that Gale would get him safely where he needed to go. And despite my indifferent response, I was definitely going to dinner with Gale. I groaned a little and put my face in my hand, trying to fight a smile and a blush. Whoever thought that a vampire would be my type? My junk was already at the front door when I got home. Well, I guess I can't call it home anymore. 
Goddamn landlord's been threatening me with eviction for months, but I guess I figured he wouldn't go through with it. Just my fucking luck. I still tried the key and felt all the dumber for it when I realized he'd changed the locks. I swear the guy had it out for me since day one. He looked at me the way a teacher looks at an unruly kid, always turning his nose up in contempt. And why? I have a fucking job. It's not a glamorous one, but I have one. Okay, sure, I've missed the past five months, Red, but there were... circumstances or something. And yeah, I scared the neighbors, sure, but I was quiet. Well, mostly. Except when I came back from working my second job at the bar at three in the morning and needed my music to unwind. I wasn't that fucking bad. Not bad enough to have my shit ditched and the locks changed on me. <sighs> Whatever. I grabbed what I could and headed to my truck. It wouldn't be the first time I'd slum it and it probably wouldn't be the last. I was surprised by how many trips it took to get all my things, considering I don't own much. The apartment had come fully furnished, so I had no big items to carry. Everything else was just knickknacks, CDs, and my tattered clothes. Pride and spite fought for control as I tried to decide where to park the truck for the night. Spite won out, and I found the landlord's spot in the lot and parked diagonally across it blocking the next spot over as well for good measure. I hope it piss off 15B or was that 158? Either way, I hoped whoever I was blocking would be damn annoyed and would blame it on the landlord. Petty? Yeah. But sometimes you need to be a little petty in life. It's good for the soul. With all my worldly shit in the bed of my truck, I sprawled down in the back of the seat and settled in for the night. <sighs> Aging is a bitch. And I realized that pretty quickly when the cramping started and my neck got sore. Being in your mid-thirties sucks. You still look young enough that people assume you can do the same shit you did in your twenties, but you feel like a fucking geriatric if you don't have a decent bed to sleep in. It fucking sucked. I was constantly waking up from the sounds of loud pops and cracks all fucking night. I thought it was weird that I heard them more than I felt them, but whatever. Early in the morning, I was woken up by a chorus of knocks on the window and an impatient, You can't be here. My body groaned as I sat up, every muscle tense, every bone stiff. And fuck, whatever other body parts we also have being really fucking done with this shit. And yeah, it was the landlord. I waved him off, or maybe flipped him off, and for some weird reason that seemed to piss him off more. Like, the fuck more do you want from me, dude? The guy had the nerve to open the driver's side door and chew me out. But before he could, I sat up and he turned white as a ghost, lifted his hands in surrender and slowly backed away from the truck. <laughs> I'm not that intimidating, am I? Fucking whatever, dude. I had a job to do. The local high school wasn't going to clean itself. I knew that much from playing hooky once. I'm sure there's some kind of poetic irony or some shit from a high school dropout working a main job as a janitor at a high school. <sighs> I fucking hated poetry, so who cares? I squeezed through the front of the truck and got into the driver's seat, picked up a coffee and booze on my way to work, and mixed both to help me start the day right. The day was uneventful. Little shits being little shits, and floors needing to be mopped. The usual janitor shit. I wasn't working at the bar that night, so when my work day was over, I had a few hours of daylight to relax and do whatever. And I was left with the same question as yesterday. Where to park the fucking truck, aka my home? I wasn't going to spend the night at the school, that was for sure. An unshaven 35-something in a truck at night on campus? Yeah, that wouldn't end well. My official school lanyard and parking pass wouldn't get me out of that nightmare. So instead, I drove a small ways out of town and stomped on the side of the road where I didn't think cops would care. 
There was a nice deep ditch I could go do my business in without being seen by passing cars. I had takeout for supper, a couple of burgers and fries sitting at my feet so they wouldn't spill. Once I parked, though, I realized they forgot one of my burgers. Like seriously, could shit get any worse? Not wanting to drive all the way back, I put my headphones on and ate bitterly as I watched the sunset through the trees. I almost fell asleep in the driver's seat while music was blasting through my ears. Almost. And I think that's what saved me. I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't snapped awake and moved to the back seat for the night. I... I don't even want to talk about it. So I moved. I closed my eyes. I don't know how long later. I hear this weird ass sound. The sound of something slapping. Slap. 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 Followed by a meek and gravelly. Help. I opened my eyes to a bright kind of darkness, the dark of a starlit sky and that always blinking blue light on the dashboard. Confused and disoriented, I mumbled, what? Reality sank in and I remembered I was in my truck, not back at my ex home where the pipes were always leaking and the mold in the bathroom looked like Abraham Lincoln. A voice replied, Help. Help. I rubbed my tired eyes. A million thoughts ran through my head and settled on some sort of car crash nearby and someone needing to be pulled out of the rubble. But as I sat upright and swept the outside by gaze, I didn't see any cars or smoke or anything else. Help me groaned the voice, a voice that clearly came from the front of the truck, now that I was conscious enough to pinpoint it. I reached for my bat and peeked through the gap of the center console, only to see movement as something long and stick-like reached out from under the driver's side seat and swatted at it. Slap. Help me... I whispered a fair share of expletives. This time, the old noggin box didn't come up with any theories. What the fuck? Help. 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 The stick-like thing slapped the seat again. I made like a cat trying to avoid the water and squeezed myself through the front passenger seat so I could get in the front and get the fuck out. Whatever was in the truck didn't follow, and I was thankful for that. I sat there, breathing heavily, eyes wide, and wondering if I'd... I don't know, had my drink spiked? There was something in my truck, something I could still see moving, something that evoked a memory of a sleepless childhood night when storms sent branches swatting at my bedroom window. I felt that same potent fear, the fear that they'd reach in and pull me out by my ankles. The difference is, I'm a grown-ass man, and I have a bat, and that was my fucking truck. I swallowed the fear, and though it came back like acid reflux, I tried to not let it stop me. I circled around the truck, bat in one hand and my other hand stretching toward the handle. My truck. My goddamn truck. My fucking home. I opened the door and reared the bat back. And stopped. The creature was under the driver's seat, wedged pathetically in the tight space with nothing but its stick-like arm able to reach out and slap the seat. It didn't even have enough range to hit the steering wheel. The thing was... Well, it looked fucked up, okay? It was a fucking monster, what more can I say? A monster would stick for arms and a bunch of little beady eyes and it was stuck under the seat. 
the bottom, no, the top, the top of its head split open vertically in a way that reminded me of a pincer. It spoke. Help me. He looked so fucking pathetic, I almost felt bad for it. What? It asked again. Help me. I let out a nervous laugh. I couldn't wrap my head around this. First of all, the nerve of this thing, creeping into my trunk and begging for help. I slowly lowered the bat. I'm stuck, it said. Yeah, I can see that, I replied. It chittered and said, I'm not as flexible as I used to be. You and me both, buddy, I thought. There was more room under your bed, it said. I blinked. Excuse me? It replied. That's where I live. Under your bed. I scratched my head. You're telling me you're the monster that lives under my bed? I am, it said. But since we got evicted, I had to squeeze under here. And that's how you got stuck. And that's how I got stuck. It looked at me with pleading eyes as its thin fingers scratched at the seat. I hoped it wouldn't tear the leather interior. That would really ruin my fucking week. I considered my options. If I help you, what's in it for me? I asked. Because I sure as shit wasn't helping a fucking monster out of my car without some sort of reward. I'll leave the altruism to altruistic people. It seemed to stop and think for a moment before it made me an offer. If you help me, I won't eat you. I snorted. <laughs> well, that's a shit deal. If I don't help you, you can't eat me. How about if I help you, you eat my landlord? I laughed. It laughed. We both laughed. And then it blinked with its multiple eyes, not at the same time, mind you. It's kind of like a wave at a hockey game. One at a time in a circular motion. Okay, but... Seriously? It asked. I shrugged. I mean, I was kidding, but... I trailed off. Look, the landlord might be a bastard, but I'm not going to put a hit out on him. I mean, if I just so happen to come across a monster and we happen to drive by his place, I can't control what the monster under my bed, under my truck seat, does. That's on him. The monster said, Well, I am hungry. That burger really wet my appetite. You motherfucker, that was mine, I shouted. But like, can you blame the thing? I would have stolen a burger too if I was cooped up under someone's truck seat and shoved it in my face like that. Okay, okay, fucking fine, I mumbled. I'll drive to his place, we'll get you out, and then you do your thing and you leave my truck for good. Understood? I gave him a stern look. He nodded, or tried to. His second and third arm were pinning his head. I motioned for him to lower his other arm. If you grab me while I'm driving, I'm warning you. I will leave the truck in the sun tomorrow so you bake alive. And no touching my junk. I motioned to the radio and crumpled up pieces of paper. Or my junk. And motioned to my groin. Clear? Crystal. Chatty McChatterbox tried to make conversation the whole drive back to town. I was not enthusiastic about it. Do you think I live alone because I can't get a boyfriend? No. It's because I like the fucking silence. 
I liked my music and I liked not having to talk to people. So I did what any person would do. I turned the music up to drown out the monster under my seat. We arrived at the complex about an hour and a piss break later. I parked off the beaten path, a shit parking spot, basically, and got out of my truck. My dumbass monster was twitching, trying to get free, and looking at me in desperation. I rubbed my temples and sighed loudly. Alright, give me your arm, I mumbled. The stick-like appendage stretched towards me. I grabbed it and started to pull. This motherfucker was in there tight. No wonder he couldn't get out. I pulled and twisted and put all my strength into it. And he would not budge. Thankfully, I had lotion in the trunk bed with the rest of my bedroom stuff for uh, my chronically chapped hands. I lathered up my monster and he finally slid out with a nice pop. He was a clumped mass on the floor for a moment before he started to unfurl, much to my horror. I don't know how many fucking arms he had because I lost count at six, but there were a lot. They were all flared out in different directions. When he stood upright, he easily towered over me, and I'm 6'5", with his stretched limbs bringing him almost twice my height. His hands were branch-like, but his elbows had serrated edges, and all I could think was what kind of mess he'd made on the other side of my seat with those. If he'd wanted to, if he hadn't been the monster of his world could have cut me down with one swipe of a single one of his many arms. Instead, he turned to the apartment complex. Which unit? I'd all but forgotten our deal, awestruck by the large creature and the impossibility of him fitting under that seat. Uh, I pointed dumbly at the apartment. That one. My monster nodded and lumbered toward the landlord's unit at a slow pace, his bones popping and cracking as he went. And I mean, yeah, I think we're both too old to be sleeping in a truck. Swapsies, no take backs. That was what my little brother Dylan used to always call out when I traded candy with him, especially around Halloween. He was six on our last Halloween together, old enough for me to take him trick-or-treating alone and for him to really appreciate it. I still remember that last time well all these years later. One reason for that is because even at nine, I appreciated that I was lucky to have such a sweet little brother. Old enough for me to baby him, but close enough to my own age to have fun with him too. We'd always been close, since he was born. Another reason was that following year, two weeks before Halloween in 2005, Dylan died in his sleep. They told us it was a congenital heart defect that had never been caught and that most likely he just stopped. Breathing in and out those soft sleep breaths I used to listen to when I had shared a room just a year earlier and then moments later just silence. Stretching on through the dark hours until our mother found him and began to scream. It destroyed our family. Even leading up to the funeral, my parents were alternating crying, consoling each other, and arguing over nothing. They wound up getting a divorce two years later. For my part, I cried some, but most of the time was reserved for hating myself, thinking about how if I hadn't made a big deal of getting my own room just a few months earlier... I might have heard him stop breathing. Might could have got him help in time. My parents told me that wasn't so. That the doctor said it was just one of those things that couldn't be helped. But all that made me wonder was... 
Who was lying? My parents or the doctors? The week after his funeral, I went back to school. We had a substitute teacher I'd never seen or heard of before. She said her name was Mrs. Grackle, and she was going to be replacing our normal fourth grade teacher, Miss Horn, until she got over the flu. She'd been there for the latter part of the week I'd missed, so the other students in my class seemed pretty much used to her. But she made my skin crawl in a way I couldn't fully understand. She wasn't dressed weird and was well-kempt. There was something off about her. Her pale skin was smooth and tight, but almost too much so, as though she had somehow been birthed as a fully grown woman with flesh that had not seen the sun or even been touched by air. I heard some of the boys whispering at lunch about how pretty Mrs. Gackle was, making the vague and clumsy innuendos that young boys do, and she was objectively attractive, with refined features and a trim figure framed by long, curly brown hair, but her eyes... They stared out like a doll's eyes, dark, hard, and indestructible. As the week wore on, I found that they kept focusing on me. It was that Wednesday that Mrs. Grackle asked me to stay after the final bell rang. I felt the knot of unease that had been growing in my belly since Monday morning tighten into a painful ball of fear. I didn't know what to say. As I watched my classmates and friends rush out of the room, I wanted to run with them to keep running until I was home again and upstairs in Dylan's room. I had taken to sleeping there again while... Elizabeth, can you come up here please? I flinched at the words, my name sounding oily and sinister on her tongue. Swallowing, I glanced up and nodded before sliding out of my desk and approaching the front of the room. Yes, ma'am? Is something wrong? The woman smiled, her perfectly even teeth gleaming like white stones between the red ring of lipstick expertly lining her lips. No, nothing like that, dear. I just wanted to check in on you, see how you were doing. When I stared at her without response, she went on. I heard about your little brother's passing, you see, just a few days ago, I understand. My chest tightened. The only blessing about school now was that it wasn't home. It gave me a forced reprieve from all the sad reminders of Dylan's death, an occasional moment where I forgot to hate myself. And now... Uh... Yes, ma'am, that's true. Mrs. Grackle made a clucking noise deep in her throat. So very sad. He was, what, five, six... Why was she asking me all of this? I wanted to tell her it was none of her business to get my brother out of her rotten mouth, but I was young and she wasn't just an adult, but a teacher, albeit a substitute one. So I just jammed my hands in my jeans and nodded, trying to avoid her unblinking stare. I heard her breath quicken slightly at my nod, and despite myself, I looked up just in time to see her wiping away a spot of drool from her pale and perfect chin. Her eyes locked with mine again, seeming to hold me where I stood. Was... Was he buried fresh and whole? didn't understand what she was asking, yet I heard myself say, Yes, whole and fresh, only four days in the ground. 
My own heart was hammering, so I knew it would burst any second. And she just kept staring at me, not letting me move, weighing something secret and terrible behind those dark eyes. And then I was home. I woke up on my bed, a moment of vertigo, sending the room spinning before my brain acclimated to where I was. My mother was calling for me to come down. It was time for us to go to Wednesday evening church services. My family had always been casually religious, but I could already tell that my mother was becoming more devout by the day. I didn't fault her for finding comfort in the church, and I'd always enjoyed Sunday school well enough, but if not for her wanting me to go, it was the last place I'd wanted to be. The strangeness of my encounter with Grackle aside, I didn't savor the idea of being buffeted between two groups of well-meaning strangers as they murmured sympathies and gave pitying looks. I wanted to be alone with my memories of Dylan and my guilt and my pain. By the time we were halfway through the service, I had half convinced myself the conversation with Grackle had just been a dream. I'd been exhausted for going on two weeks and waking up at a home like that. Well, it just made more sense than a substitute teacher trying to talk to me about Dylan and his burial like that. It also made me realize something else. I could go visit him. Dylan's actual funeral had been in a sanctuary at one of our local funeral homes, but he was buried in one of the far new lots of the church's cemetery. I felt a stir of sad excitement at the thought of going to visit him, and even though it was getting dark as we left the service, when I asked my mother if I could go see him for a minute, she only nodded absently before going back to talking with two of her commensurating friends. I ran across the first cemetery lot and on to the second. I'd spent time playing around these tombstones for years, so it wasn't hard to pick my way toward his grave even in the dimming twilight. It was that familiarity and expectation of what I should see around his grave that first gave me pause as I got closer. There was some kind of small hill next to his gravestone. A roundish mound that hadn't been there last time we'd visited a few days before. Even more strange, there was someone already at Dylan's grave. And they were digging. I felt confused anger and fear as I picked up speed again, yelling, Hey! Stop! Even as the figure stood up and turned to face me. The orange glow of the fading October sun, that pale skin seemed to blaze in the dark, the cascade of brown curls looking now more like dark twines, twisted down into the mires of some forbidden swamp. Mrs. Gackle smiled at me briefly before returning to her digging. Stop! I said stop! I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it was wrong in a way that went beyond anything I'd ever experienced before. I didn't know words like desecration or sacrilege yet, but in my heart, every thundering beat screamed bad, wrong, stop, in a staccato rhythm that permeated my whole body and weakened my knees. But she didn't stop. She kept digging, her long, thin-fingered hands churning up the dirt as she made quick work of the earth beneath her and her prize. Within a few seconds, she'd uncovered the small white coffin where my brother lay and drug it out of his grave with surprising ease. I started screaming at her again, but I trailed off into silence as I saw where she was taking it. The strange new hill wasn't a hill at all. It was a person. Or at least part of one. 
hulking and covered in rags, the figure was incomplete. Somehow, as impossible as it seemed, it stood there with a large cavity in its middle. There was no head, and below where it should be, a ragged darkness gaped out from between the folds of tattered cloth. I was still staring at it dumbly as Mrs. Grackle reached it. She let go of Dylan's casket, and giving me a quick wry glance, she pulled herself into that larger body, her flesh twisting and flowing to fill the chasm and complete the towering thing before me. Her head looked different now, and in truth, she was wholly unrecognizable except for those same damned black, staring eyes. She swung those eyes toward me and twisted her mouth oddly before speaking in a deep and rough voice. You say no, but what do you offer in exchange? The thing paused as considering, but I could tell from its tone that it was simply playing a game, mocking me. Yourself. I had felt frozen to the ground before, but now I started backing away. What? Exchange? A short, coarse laugh. <laughs> A trade. Dylan goes back in the hole, and you come with me. I stopped again, in spite of my fear. Go with you? Where? A longer, nastier chuckle. <laughs> oh, you'll see. What'd you say? Just remember, if you say yes, the deal is struck. It held out its hand to me, and then, in a higher voice like that of a child, it screeched. Swapsies. No takebacks. I ran. I ran through the deepened shadows, terrified that any moment that enormous long-fingered hand would close on my shoulder or seize my ankle. I ran back into the church, and when I clutched my mother with tears streaming down my face, she looked down and began to cry herself, sweeping me up in her arms and carrying me back to the car to go home. She thought I was just upset at visiting the grave, and it wasn't until the next day that her and my father started questioning me more intently. after the church groundskeeper found what had happened to Dylan's grave. I lied, of course. They never would have believed me, and I was too upset for them to press me hard. I later wondered if that lie, unknown but possibly somehow still sensed by my parents, was what solidified the distance that continued to grow between the three of us. They were still good parents, or good enough, and I know that they loved me, but that final loss of my brother, the terrible mystery of how and why and where he was taken, was what finally killed the laboring heart of my family forever. There was one other lie I never told my parents, though. This one was more of omission. I never told them about the note I found on my desk when I finally returned to school on Friday, the first day of Mrs. Holmes' return. I never told them about the note I found on my desk when I finally returned to school on Friday, the first day of Mrs. Horn's own return. It was written in small, slanted blue letters in a neatly cut square of yellowing paper, a light smudge of pink staining the top right corner. Holding the paper in my trembling hands, I read the words over and over. Even now, there's not a day I don't see them in my mind. Thank you for the num-nums, Elizabeth. I enjoyed them last night, and they were delicious. Every day on my way to work, I passed the cemetery on Richmond Road. I'd always thought there was something off about it, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. 
Maybe it was the overgrown grass, the washed out tombstones, the fact that it was always empty, or the lack of flowers on any of the graves. I don't know exactly what it was, but whenever the bus drove by, I was left with a strange feeling in my gut. The cemetery seemed unreal somehow, like trying to look through a window only to discover it was just a painting on the wall. There were no churches or mortuaries nearby and no identifying feature. Just a graveyard on its own, seemingly out of place. It wasn't until my mother's funeral a few months ago that I became compelled to look into it. You see, the cemetery where she was buried, across town so she could be with her parents, had an entirely different atmosphere. It had a sort of weight to it. A weight that the cemetery on Richmond Road lacked. Even when I returned to the gravesite on my own, the cemetery still had a presence of sorts, almost as though it was buzzing with life, whereas the one on Richmond Road felt stale, clinical, and sterile. I started asking around at work. My curiosity only grew when I realized nobody knew anyone who'd been buried there, not even distant relatives. The mystery quickly became an obsession of mine, a burning curiosity that couldn't help but be quelled unless I knew the truth. I'd have to dig deeper to find it. My first step was to consult the records at City Hall. According to official documents, the cemetery land was in an industrial zone, unlike community cemeteries which were marked as urban service zones. My next step was to find out who owned the land. Unfortunately, I couldn't gather any information on its current owners. I tried researching who originally bought it, but the graveyard's inception predated the available records. My final step was sorting through decades of city maps, hoping to come up with a timeline for the graveyard's construction. If I could narrow down when it was established, I could focus my research. Pre-60s era maps identified it as a forested area, while post-60s era maps had it blocked off entirely. For all intents and purposes, the graveyard shouldn't have existed. One evening, when my curiosity boiled over, I wandered into the graveyard. You could say that I broke in, but the gate wasn't locked and I didn't see a keep out sign. As I strolled through the unkempt row of tombstones, I realized something. They were identical, save for the names on the front. Same size, same rate of decay, same type of marble. They were placed out in identical, perfectly aligned rows. All factors that contributed to the graveyard lacking a touch of human warmth. The most chilling detail, however, had to be the year etched on their polished surfaces. Every single one was marked 1965, leading me to wonder if I was standing on some sort of war monument, but the era was wrong. What did this mass grave signify. I can't quite explain why, but as I stood in the graveyard with only the sound of the frigid wind to keep me company, I couldn't help but think the graves I was standing on were empty. In my mind, I could picture hundreds of caskets, their silk lining still in pristine condition, and their pillows plump and untouched. A strange thought, perhaps, but one I couldn't shake. It was then that I saw a spade resting against a nearby tree. Rust circled up the shaft like climbing vines, eating away at the metallic green paint on its surface. The spade had been left out in the elements for too long, I figured. I eyed it for a long moment, unable to make up my mind. I was alone. 
I had the opportunity to prove my theory. All these months, no, years, of unanswered questions, and I finally had a chance to get to the bottom of them. My fingers wrapped around the handle. I pulled the spade over my head and glared at the foot of the nearest grave. My body tensed. My heart raced. Could I really do it? I was trembling, shaking in my boots. I hadn't even done anything yet. But I was already drowning with guilt and regret. What was I doing? What was I expecting to find buried beneath the ground? I was sickened by my own morbid thoughts and actions. This obsession had to end. How could I have let it get this far? I lowered my arms, took a step back, and hung my head in shame. I didn't have time to dwell on that shame for too long. Footsteps broke through the silence of the night. I could feel blood draining from my face as I froze where I stood. Had the cops come to arrest me for trespassing? I wanted to run, but I was afraid I'd get into even more trouble if I did. I knew someone was bound to get curious eventually, said a calm voice. I reflexively clutched the spade tightly and held it against my chest as I turned around to face the speaker. There was an old man peering at me. He was wearing a knitted sweater, brown pants, and tattered black shoes. The crow's feet around his eyes stretched as he smiled softly. You're curious about the grave, right? He murmured, motioning toward the plot. I stared at him, speechless. I had been caught with my hand in the cookie jar and didn't quite know how to explain myself. There was no lie in the world that could properly justify my actions. My face twisted as I racked my brain, trying to come up with a response, but my thoughts fluttered away in every direction, like dandelion fuzz in the breeze. Well, don't just stand there, he said, motioning for me to come closer. Shivering, I blindly obeyed and bridged the distance between us. He smiled and looked me in the eyes. Come on, let's get you warmed up with some coffee. I'm sure you must have questions. My fingers squeezed the spade protectively. I shyly averted my gaze from the stranger and lowered my head closer to my shoulders, trying to make myself smaller. Not much of a talker, are you? he asked, letting out a soft chuckle. He extends his arm toward the back of the property where I could just barely make out the outline of a building. Come on now, don't be shy. Still looking away, I loosened my grip an inch toward the tree. I placed the spade right back down where I'd found it. As soon as I let it go, it toppled over. I reached down to grab it, but felt a hand on my shoulder to stop me. It's fine, just leave it. Come on. I promise I won't bite. He didn't sound sinister. His voice was calm, warm, and welcoming. He was the embodiment of a grandfather, but still, something put me ill at ease. <laughs> was it him, or the shame and disgust I was feeling at myself? His hand moved from my shoulder to my back. I felt him push against it very lightly, like a parent guiding their child. I found myself walking along, unable to speak or look at anything but my own two feet. I'll explain everything once we get inside, he assured me. He led me to a concrete building at the very outskirts of the cemetery. Though the outside was cold and unwelcoming, the inside had a homey feel to it. There were couches, an old television, and a bed in the corner. It almost looked like a hunter's cabin, minus the shotguns and animal hides. 
On the bookshelf in the corner was a large, framed photo of half a dozen people wearing lab coats. It had to have been quite old, judging by its grainy texture, lack of color, and the outdated hairstyles of the men and women photographed therein. Have a seat. I'll be right back, he said. He disappeared into the kitchen, leaving me to meander around the living room. I could have run away at that point, but I was paralyzed, mortified by what I'd done. I could hear the sounds of a coffee maker gurgling from the other room and ceramic cups clanging against one another. Do you take anything with your coffee? Sugar? Milk? Cream? He asked as he returned with a fresh cup. Uh, sugar. The words wouldn't come out. I swallowed and cleared my throat. <clears> throat> sugar. Sh- sugar, please. He clapped his hands together and chuckled. (laughs) So he speaks. My cheeks flushed red with embarrassment. He handed me a cup of coffee. Name? Uh, Isaiah. (laughs) Odd name for someone so young. My mom was religious. You? No. Tell me. Do you believe in the soul? No? He smiled a knowing smile. So tell me, Isaiah. What were you doing digging up the grave? My heart stopped. It was the question I was dreading. I could have spent my time coming up with an answer, but I didn't. My mind had gone blank from the moment I'd seen him to the moment he'd placed the cup of coffee in my hands. Well, he insisted. I tried to take a sip of coffee to buy some time, but it was still scalding hot. I... I had a hunch. A hunch... That it'd be empty, I answered. He took a seat opposite from me and smiled again, nodding his head as though he'd anticipated the answer. What if I told you that you were right? Am I? He nodded. Are they all empty? The graves, I mean. I asked. I figured he knew he lived on the property after all. He nodded. Every last coffin. You want to know why? I hesitated. Did I? Was this one of those things like in the movies where he'd tell me he was going to have to kill me if he told me the truth? I tensed, fingers digging into my kneecaps nervously. He laughed lightheartedly. You shouldn't be so afraid of me, you know. I'm not the one digging up graves in the middle of the night, he said. Touche. Please, tell me, I finally requested. He leaned back against the chair, setting in like a storyteller preparing to weave a fantastic tale for his children. It all started... Back in the 60s, when I was... He cupped a hand to his chin and squinted at me. I'd say about your age. I was working with a team of medical researchers on improving organ transplantation. You see, back then, transplants were still fairly new. We weren't sure which organs could and couldn't be successfully transplanted. I took a sip of coffee, listening to him attentively. I wondered where he was going with this. Was he a mad scientist who disemboweled his victims just to see if he could? Would I be next? He looked longingly toward the photo on the shelf. It was while researching the brain that we realized something that brought our research to a complete standstill. Something that shook us to the core of our foundation. 
we discover the brain lives on, even after death. I snorted, but quickly slapped my hand over my mouth. I, I'm sorry, that's just not what I was expecting to hear. I pressed my lips together. I'm sorry, but what you're saying is impossible. He shook his head. It's all right. I understand your skepticism. I was skeptical too back then, but it's true. We discovered life after death, so to speak, in the form of electrical impulses, barely noticeable, really. Even days after the body has died, the brain still sends out just the faintest of signals. You almost have to be looking for it to know it's there, but it is. His smile faded into a solemn frown. And the brain continues to do so, until it putrefies completely. I became overwhelmed with apprehension. I didn't quite understand what he was trying to say, but the mere thought of it made me uncomfortable. The hairs on my forearm stood at attention. A bead of sweat rolled down my temple and landed on my lap. I swallowed a knot hanging out in my throat. Like a... Like a chicken running around with its head cut off, right? He shook his head. No. That is completely different. Those are just the nerves still firing at random. What we found was... He paused, trying to come up with the right word. Organized. Deliberate. Messages sent through the brain. Signals that are much slower than with a living specimen and much less active, but still present. When you die, your brain is still aware of what's going on. His faded blue eyes looked into mine. Despite his age, I could see vitality behind their cloudy facade. I looked away, unable to maintain eye contact. My gaze fell on the brown liquid in the cup between my fingers. He continued. The brain is aware of everything. I thought of the caskets in the graveyard. I was starting to understand why they were empty. Uh, even autopsies? I asked hesitantly. He brought his hands together and nodded. We cut them open like it's nothing, without realizing what we're doing, but if that wasn't bad enough... He started, his voice becoming sharper. We extend their suffering. The brain under normal circumstances, should decay within a few days. But we chill our corpses. We embalm them so they can be put on display. We lock them up in caskets and bury them deeper in the ground. Nowadays, brains can survive weeks, sometimes even a month longer than they should. Goes against the natural order of things. I felt ill. If he was right, if he wasn't just some crazy old coot, then I could only imagine the kind of horrors people had endured. Could they feel their bodies being cut open? Embalming fluid, flushing their system, their skin being sewn and prepped for viewing? How long did they feel the four walls of their caskets? closed down around them before they finally found rest. He had to be wrong. He just had to be. There's no way, I murmured tensely. He sighed. I know it's hard to believe, but it's the truth. We were all shocked. We didn't want to believe it. We performed countless tests, but we all came to the same conclusion. We couldn't do much, though. Only destroy the bodies sent to us. Make sure none of them suffered. 
What about all the graves? He smiled. (laughs) Those are symbolic. The families know no one's buried there. We were working with bodies donated to science. The graveyard was just to give families a place to mourn and collect themselves, but since most of our specimens came from out of town, well, nobody ever really bothered coming to the graveyard after the funerals, he explained. Plots were empty, after all. Why make the trip? What about everyone else? The ones who weren't sent to you? Everyone who's been buried since then? I asked. My leg began to tremble from nervous agitation as I worried about my mother who'd been buried recently. If you're right, then that's all well and good, but what about the millions of people who still get buried every year? This case softened. We did everything we could. We reported our findings, omitting a few details, of course. We wouldn't want to cause a panic, or worse, have our funding cut. We did help initiate long-term results. It's no coincidence that fewer and fewer people get buried nowadays, you know. Cremation is a common practice, but... You know how bureaucracy goes. Like most things, change takes time. I sat there, head in my hands, staring at the floor while the cup of coffee cooled on the table next to me. Why tell me this? I asked. I didn't want to know. Why would anyone want to know? I could hear him shuffling in his seat. He got up, walked to the bookshelf in the corner, and grabbed the photograph. I told you out of selfishness, he answered. You see, my fellow researchers died, one after the other, leaving me as the only man alive who knows the truth. He knelt down in front of me so our eyes could meet. I'm getting along in the years now. Won't be long before I'm dead and gone. I don't want to suffer. I need someone to take care of me when the time comes. Please. I need you to destroy my brain. I stood up shaking. What? No. I'm not... I'm not a killer. He laughed nervously and shook his head. (laughs) No, not... Not right now. When I die, please. I put it in my last will and testament, but I know how these things go. They won't destroy the brain. They'll cremate me eventually, but not quickly enough. He grabbed my legs tightly and looked up at me, his calm and controlled behavior suddenly desperate and panicked. Please. I'm begging you. I don't have any living relatives. Let me mark you as a next of kin. They'll let you in, and then you can do it. Please. I don't want to suffer while I wait to be cremated. I don't want to feel the fires melting my skin. I didn't know what to say or do. What he was asking for was inhuman but I had a feeling he wouldn't let go unless I agreed. I nodded hesitantly. All right. His grip loosened instantly. He let out a sigh of relief and pushed himself to his feet. I could see him wiping his eyes on his sleeve. Had he actually started crying? Good, good. I'll just take down your information, he said, wobbling to the kitchen for a pen and paper pad. I know what you must be thinking. Why didn't I just give him fake info? The truth is, I was so frazzled that I reacted automatically. I gave him my address, my phone number, and name. Everything. When I was done... I left. 
I wandered out of the graveyard feeling shaken to the core. I hoped what he told me was a delusion. I hoped he'd fade away to the back of my mind and that I'd never get a call about him. I went to bed that night and stared at the ceiling for hours, imagining decaying bodies trapped in their dark tombs, able to hear and feel but unable to see anything or call for help, a fate worse than being buried alive. No one knew the pain that they were in. They couldn't scream or scratch at the surface. They just lay there and feel themselves withering away. The chilling imagery kept me up well into the morning hours, even after convincing myself that the old man was crazy. The anxiety persisted. The fear was electric, tingling the back of my neck like someone blowing on my skin. I couldn't get the morbid thoughts out of my mind. They ate away at me like acid rain on an old swing set. And then the phone rang. I picked it up and brought it to my ear. Hello? Is this Isaiah Brown? Yeah, I replied nervously. Had the old man reported me to the police for grave robbery? Were they going to arrest me? This is the Richmond Hospital. You were marked out as an emergency contact for your great uncle. He was taken into the hospital early this morning. We're going to need you to come in. My stomach dropped. As far as I knew, I didn't have a great uncle. It had to have been the man from the night before. Never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be notified of his death, especially not so soon. I should have refused to go, but something in me compelled me to comply. Less than half an hour later, I arrived at the hospital. A nurse informed me that my great uncle had passed away. She led me to his bedside and left me there, closing the door behind her. Judging by the cleanliness of the room, it seemed as though his stay at the hospital hadn't been too chaotic at least. There was only a crash card in the corner and a few discarded tools as proof that he'd received treatment. I unhooked the chart hanging over the foot of his bed and read it. His name was Herbert Jones. Died at the age of 81 from heart failure. A sinking feeling in my gut told me it wasn't coincidental. Herbert had been waiting for someone like me to come along. Had he offed himself once he passed on his final request? I stood in front of him and stared at his lifeless body, wondering if there was any truth to what he told me the night before. He lay there, dead as a doorknob, eyes foggy, blank stare locked in on the ceiling, but as I leaned in closer and really looked into his hazy eyes, I saw something. A light. A faint sparkle of life behind his faded irises. It was like looking into a frost-covered window on a cold winter's night and just barely seeing the outline of a family around the fireplace. Something you'd never see unless you knew to look. Was this why people usually close the eyes of the departed? I staggered back, a chill spreading from my extremities to my heart, clutching it like a vice-like grip. I understood what I had seen, what Herbert had been talking about, the conclusion he tried to lead me to. I had seen his soul. He was dead, but his soul hadn't left his body. It was trapped inside of him, waiting to be freed, waiting for me to free it. Hesitantly, I reached for a scalpel left behind on the tray next to his bed. 
I reared my arm back and stared at his head at my target. I was shaking like a leaf. Destroy the brain, I whispered to myself in shock. The words were horrifying, the kind of words reserved for zombie movies. The instrument felt heavy in my hand, or perhaps it was the weight of responsibility that weighed it down. I wish I could say that I respected Herbert's final wishes, but I'd be lying if I did. I was too afraid of the consequences. What if a nurse walked in and caught me? What if I missed? What if the sound of his brain sloshing against the walls of his cranium haunted me for the rest of my life? I dropped the scalpel and ran out of the room, my stomach a mess of knots, my heart caged lion roaring to escape. Herbert put his faith in me, and I let him down. I let the hospital perform their autopsy, and God knows what else. I just pray they cremated him at least. I am a musician. Not a terribly great one, but still, I consider myself a musician. I can play with the best of them, and I know my way around an instrument or two. More importantly, I'm a collector. A collector of various items ranging from the odd to the obscure. There's no rhyme or reason to my collection. It consists of anything uniquely interesting that I can get my hands on. That is why, when I saw an ad on Craigslist for a vintage, rustic red piano, I couldn't help but reach out to the seller. The ad's title seemed normal enough. Old piano, free to a good home. I'd seen countless like it before. Nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly not something that would normally grab my attention. Still, I felt a strange need to click on it. Perhaps I was bored, or maybe I just wanted to see what it looked like. Either way, I gave in to my compulsion. Upon clicking the ad, there was no picture. Just an anomalous but intriguing story. It read something like this. I'm offering my piano to anyone who is willing to come and pick it up. It is very old but still playable. I can prove this upon your arrival. It is red and bears no brand markings. This is because it was made by my great-grandfather. It is one of a kind. He went out himself and chopped down a redwood tree to provide the material to build it. It took many days to finally cut down the tree, and much, much longer to finish the piano. Nearly his entire life was put into this thing. I, however, have no use for it. It has been passed down in my family many times over. I have no wish to continue the tradition, and the piano is currently taking up too much space in my home. I want it gone as quickly as possible. You can reach me by my phone number listed below. Serious inquiries only. Margaret. Reading the ad sparked my curiosity. One of a kind? Redwood tree? <laughs> How strange and absurd. I had to see this thing. If it was half as remarkable as Margaret's description made it out to be, then it was a must-have for my ever-growing collection. As such, I decided to give her a call. Margaret answered the phone after the first ring and immediately asked, Is this about the piano? <laughs> she was thrilled to hear I was interested. I too was thrilled, happy to know that it was still available. We set up a time for the next day for me to come over and take a look at it. I hung up the phone, excited as could be. I had a feeling this piano would become the new centerpiece of my collection. My antiques and oddities spanned many eras of history as well as numerous countries. They ranged anywhere from the mundane to the wildly bizarre, but all of them were nothing if not great conversation pieces. 
Some of my favorites included a genuine voodoo doll from Louisiana, a tooth from a saber-toothed cat, a book of spells written by an alleged witch, and a piece of an antler from the world's largest moose. Being a musician, I also owned callous instruments, way too many to list. Each time I acquired a new item, my heart would race with excitement. Whatever it was, becoming the focus of my attention. The piano was no different. I couldn't wait to see it in person. I woke up the following day with no resistance to my alarm, swiftly starting my daily routine in an effort to minimize the time between me and Margaret. She said she was an early bird and that I could swing by early. With this in mind, I showered, brushed my teeth, and got dressed at a record pace, making it out the door roughly 25 minutes after getting out of bed. It might sound silly to be so worked up over a material object, but to that I'd say you must not be a collector. Seeing this piano in person was my mission, and it was one I intended to see through to the end. I found myself at Margaret's home within the hour. It was a quaint cottage at the end of a dead-end road, surrounded by shrubbery and a forest. There was an old tire swinging in the backyard, indicating that it may have been where Margaret grew up. I wondered if her parents passed away and left her the house. Maybe the piano reminded her of them, and that was the real reason she was getting rid of it. My speculation was interrupted by a woman racing out of the cottage to greet me. She signaled for me to come back inside, and she went back in herself. There was no doubt this was Margaret. I hadn't identified myself in any way, but it wasn't likely that she received many visitors out where she was. Eager to see the piano, I quickly jumped out of my car and made my way up the stone walkway to the front door. Entering the house, Margaret seemed overjoyed to see me. It was jarring, but certainly made things a little less awkward. We exchanged a few pleasantries before she rushed me over to the room that housed the piano. She was excited to show me it, just as excited as I was to see it. I matched her pace as we made our way there. Upon entering, I stopped, dead in my tracks. There, just a few yards away, was the piano in all of its glory. It was a beautiful concoction of wood and ivory, the likes of which I had never seen. It was such a striking red color, giving it an illustrious and bold finish, and the design was magnificent. Simple, yet elegant, highly original, and certainly one of a kind like Margaret stated in her ad. I stood there for a moment, my mouth agape in awe. Margaret mistook my reaction for disinterest, quickly going off on a sales pitch about its charm and history. She then sat down at its stool and placed her hands over the keys. I tuned it yesterday after your call. Let's hear how it sounds. Margaret played a beautiful piece. In addition to playing, she sang. This is when I took my attention away from the piano and allowed myself to notice her. She was young, maybe in her late twenties. Beautiful, slender. She had silver highlights in her hair, giving it a strange, albeit lovely, luster. Her singing voice, accompanied by the wonderfully rich tone of the piano, captivated me in a way that I can't put into words. I allowed myself to be taken by the song until she finished. Before I could compliment her, Margaret continued her well-rehearsed sales pitch. I don't know if it was her playing or her voice, but I was sold the minute she touched the keys. Because of this, I interrupted her. I'll, I'll take it. She was astounded when I said this. Really? You will? <sighs> Wonderful. We were both happy and everything seemed fine, but one fact kept creeping and crawling in the back of my mind. The history of each piece in my collection was important to me, and the pianos had gaps that needed to be filled. 
So, have you lived in this house your whole life? I asked, secretly fishing for information. Yes, as did my parents. The house is very old, older than the piano. And your great-grandfather, he lived here as well? I asked. Yes, he did. Well, redwoods only grow in California, and they're truly massive. It seems unlikely that he would make the trek out here or even have able to been chopped one down, especially with the many trees here at his disposal. It was at this point Margaret realized I caught her in a lie. She apologized to me and came clean. It would seem that the piano was made from a red tree, just not red wood. Instead, it was a strange tree located deep in a nearby forest. Being an avid historian, Margaret's great-grandfather knew all about it. This particular tree was a local legend, and it had always been his dream to find it. It was known as the Blood Tree a sacred place of indigenous people's worship from a time long since past. Anyone who touched it was sent to live a long life filled with luck and prosperity. Those who wounded it, however, would forever know fear and misfortune. Her great-grandfather, of course, fell into the latter category. Though she claimed to not believe in the legend, she was worried the curse would scare off anyone who wanted it. Dark past or not, I still wanted it. Even more than I had previously. Despite Margaret's deception, I attempted to offer her money. She wouldn't have it, insisting I just take the thing off her hands. That would have been fine, but I couldn't bring myself to offer nothing in return. Eventually, I broke her down, handing over an envelope with a few hundred bucks in it. She reluctantly accepted and helped me lift the thing to the bed of my truck. I waved as I drove off, satisfied with my purchase. Later on, with the help of a friend, I positioned it in the perfect spot in my living room. I had a new piece for the collection, and all was right in the world. Or so I thought. For a few days, my life continued as it normally did. My routine remained unchanged. The only difference was the new piece of furniture that grabbed my attention whenever I entered the room. After a while, I barely noticed it was there. Despite its beauty, it soon blended in with the rest of my home, much like the other items in my collection. One night, however, changed this. I just laid down and begun drifting into a light sleep when a loud bang downstairs jolted me awake. I jumped out of bed and took a moment to gather my wits. The sound was unmistakably the piano's fallboard slamming shut over the keys. That could easily happen on its own had I left it open. This was not the case. I hadn't played the piano once since I procured it. So what created the sound? I raced downstairs in an effort to satisfy my curiosity and put my mind at ease. And what I found did neither. The piano's fallboard was up. Not only had it not shut over the keys, but it was inexplicably open despite my never touching it. Confusion swam through my brain, but soon submitted to the clutches of late-night weariness. In an effort to make sense of things, I shut the fallboard and chalked up the noise to an animal outside before venturing back to bed. There was nothing to worry about. The next day was pretty normal, at first. I woke up early took a shower, brushed my teeth, and started my commute. I worked and dealt with the stress that came along with it, just as I always did. The piano was the farthest thing from my mind. 
It wasn't until I got home that it creeps its way back in. Upon opening the door to my house, I was greeted by a cold gust that rushed out from within. I hadn't left the AC on, so this was strange. I walked into the living room and set my jacket on the couch. I then looked up and noticed the piano. The fall board, it was... It was up. But that couldn't be. I, I, I shut it the night before. Had, had someone broken in? I sped around my house, a kitchen knife in hand, ready to attack any would-be intruder. But there was no one. After checking every inch of the house, I eventually found myself back in my living room, in front of that piano. The fallboard was now down. Was I going mad? No, of course not. This was just the byproduct of an exhausted, overworked mind. Nothing more. At least that's what I told myself to keep from dwelling on it. Still, somewhat frazzled, I escaped to my bedroom and attempted to catch some shut-eye. After changing out of my work attire and into my nightwear, my body fell into bed, an ocean of warm blankets and pillows enveloping me. A good end to a bad day, I thought. As luck would have it, sleep would elude my grasps. Quickly after closing my eyes, there was another sound downstairs. This time it wasn't the fall board, no. It was music. And not just any music either. It was the piano. With nothing but adrenaline to guide me, I ran downstairs to see what was going on. Upon reaching the bottom step, the music stopped, and I watched as the fallboard slammed itself shut over the keys. My heart sank as I stood in place, shocked. When the moment passed, I ran back to my room and locked the door behind me. A vile mixture of fear and dismay crept under the covers with me. Company often kept when hiding from creatures in the dark, byproducts of overactive imaginations. This monster, however, was all too real. The sound of my alarm woke me up the next day. I was surprised I slept, wondering if the previous night had been a bad dream. This wasn't the case, but my mind gave in to the notion. Living in a state of denial was better than living in a world where pianos came to life. It was a splendid defense mechanism and one that allowed me to go back to my day without fear or unease. I left, went to work, came home, and went to bed. Everything was back to normal, just as I told myself it was. But lies only stretch so far. The familiar pang of ivory keys snuck into my room as panic set in again. That's when it hit me. This wasn't paranormal. It couldn't be. It was a cheap parlor trick. Margaret must have outfitted the piano to play itself, much like the player pianos of old. This was just a prank. A laugh at my expense. That's why the damned thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork, as soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it nonchalantly, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of its crevices, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. Nothing at all. My calm demeanor vanished. 
I stared at the redwood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, What are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly obliterated by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but the terror kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A haunting peace filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear, but then I noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. It took off before the moonlight could reveal its identity. This was enough to break my trance. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while, the song raged on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret had not rigged the piano to play on its own, but I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different. Something... Something not of this world. All at once, the music stopped and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point, but where were the crickets chirping and the frogs croaking and the trees swaying? Where was the life outside of my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. Every living creature in the vicinity had disappeared. What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home hoping for answers, but was instead greeted with an unsettling sight. It was so dark I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was the same silhouette from my window. My body instinctively jolted out of fear, but the figure did not react. It was frozen like the rest of the world. I took this opportune moment to investigate. The entity was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. And its face was nothing but pure darkness. I cautiously attempted to pull away the shroud from its head, but it would not budge. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano's song recommenced, and in an instant, the world returned to life. A vortex of dark energy swirled around the shadowy figure as it reached out for me with skeletal hands. I fell back but managed to escape unscathed, crawling out the front door in an awkward slur of motion. Rushing over to my car, I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that wasn't my home. During my drive, I weighed my options. Destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it, Margaret. Maybe she would know what to do. My tires left tread marks on the road as they peeled off in the direction of Margaret's house. The whole drive was a blur, my mind in dire straits over the piano and its ghost, but luckily the trip was a short one. It was late, but I didn't care. With the car parked in the driveway, my still shaking legs carried me up the walkway toward the front door. My march, however, was impeded. The cloaked figure was there, standing at the door to Margaret's house. 
Before I could so much as turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its vicious strength kept me anchored in place. My body cowered as it leaned over me, almost as if to say, Leave this place. Its grip wavered for a moment, allowing me a small window of opportunity to escape. I hightailed it out of there without looking back. Defeated, I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom where I locked the door and fell onto my bed, mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of solace as the song started up again the second my head hit the pillow. The house quaked beneath me, but I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in startling me. I jumped out of my bed and pushed my dresser to the door, hiding beneath my sheets. I attempted to tune out the ruckus around me. The banging persisted, but I chose instead to focus on the song, allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark and sullen, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me, relaxed me to the point that my eyes grew tired. Despite the pandemonium, I fell asleep and dreamt. The dream world I found myself in was different than that of my usual dreamscapes. It was overwhelmingly vivid and ambient. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had was also difficult to explain. Lucidity is too small a concept. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them. Their history, their purpose, and their place in relation to the rest of the world. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream's visual makeup was that of a forest. It was dense, but my astral form floated to a clearing past the roots and branches. It was a large meadow, and at its center, a large red tree. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano, the building blocks of a haunting in the form of a sacred plant. As I marveled at the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind it, an indigenous man. He didn't speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This was when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The indigenous man put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same. Bewildered and awestruck, I obliged. The glowing lines raced past my skin. It was an incredible sensation. As these lines traveled, my eyes were filled with visions. A glimpse into the blood tree's past. Its bark wasn't always red. Willing indigenous people came up to the tree every year, sliced their hands open, and placed them around its trunk. Their blood then dripped to its base, representing the lifeliness of their people. It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life, a place free from worry or judgment. A place of peace. More moments came to me as the glowing lines circled our hands. This was also where the indigenous buried their dead. After placing one of their own in the earth, one of the elders would play a song on what appeared to be an ocarina. The same song my piano played every night. 
It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted onto the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision ceased, my new friend released his hand from the bark, reached into his satchel, and pulled out Nakarena. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. He handed it over and motioned for me to play instead. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but I felt no need to defy his wishes. With a little practice, I was able to get a hang of the instrument and play the song he sought to hear. As I played, the blood tree began wilting, its bark changing from red to black. My friend was ecstatic. For one reason or another, this is what he wanted. It wasn't until I woke moments later in bed that the pieces of the puzzle clicked into place. Margaret's ancestor had taken away the indigenous people's headstone. More than that, he violated their connection to nature as well as one another. The tree and its spirits had to be put to rest once and for all, and there was only one way to do this. I can't explain how, but I knew I needed to play the song of death on the piano the whole way through without interruption. It was the only thing that would break the curse. I ran downstairs and put my plan into action. When my hands touched the keys, the house violently shook, knocking frames and furniture all over the place. I kept my composure out of the corner of my eye. I saw the dark figure standing at my window again. Still, I continued. I had an obligation to preserve. If not for the tree or its ghosts, then for myself. The nightmare had to end. The cloaked entity materialized at different spots in the room, sometimes next to me, other times breathing down my neck. I paid it no attention despite my fear. I'd come too far to let my balance waver now. Just as the shadowy figure sat next to me at the piano, I struck the final note of the song. The madness around me stopped. A weight was lifted from my shoulders and those of many others. I turned to the figure beside me and noticed the pelt of dark energy surrounding it was no longer there. It reached up and pulled the shroud from its face, revealing its identity. It was the indigenous man from my dream. He threw me a thankful smile before vanishing, happy to be released from his purgatory. I, too, was elated. The ordeal was over, and countless spirits could rest easy, free to cross over to the other side. My work was done. Months have passed, and the piano remains in my living room, quieter than it's ever been before. I even play it from time to time. If there's one thing you can take away from my experience, it's to be mindful of the things that go bump in the night. Some of them might just be wayward souls trying to communicate, begging for a chance to be heard by the living. Try your best not to be frightened. You might be surprised what you can do to help. And please, let this tale be a warning to you. Don't ever buy strange things from Craigslist. You'll thank me later. The last time I babysat, I watched someone die. I was in college, and back then babysitting was one of the best ways for me to make extra money. I'd done work study the first semester, but the pay was really low, and the hours tended to suck. And the available jobs were always the ones you got interrupted enough that squeezing in study time at work was hard, especially once I decided to double major and needed access to a laptop most of the time. But babysitting, once I got a good reputation as safe, responsible, and willing to work on short notice, was the best of both worlds. Better pay 
shorter hours, and with younger children or stricter parents, I sometimes had two or three hours of fairly interrupted time while the kids slept upstairs. It wasn't always steady work, but the flexibility made it worth it, and usually I enjoyed myself too. The kids tended to be cool for the most part, and the couple of times I ran into real brats, I just didn't go back again. But Aaron was always one of my favorites. Only six, she was both slight and quiet for her age, with long brown hair framing a small featured face dominated by sad eyes that rarely lit up except for when she was playing by herself and didn't know you were looking. It was strange that I would like her best. There were children I had more fun with and knew better after all, but I could tell that she liked me and that such a thing was rare for her. When I took her to the park, she would hold my hand ditfully, and I occasionally gave her a hug. She didn't shy away as she'd seen her family do to friends and relatives at times. Odd as it sounded, her approval of me made me feel special, and that in turn made her special to me. The night of the screaming and death and terror started out very normal boring, even. I had to study for a test next Tuesday, but aside from that and watching TV, I was actually kind of out of things to do. Erin had been up in her room playing when I got there at 7, and I knew not to expect her parents back until after midnight, so by a bit after 8, I decided to check in on her and see if she wanted to come down and watch a movie or something. I could hear her whispering as I approached the cracked door and found myself pausing for a moment straining to hear what she was saying. No, you're the silly one. It doesn't make sense. I remember frowning at that. I had a lot of experience hearing children playing, including having make-believe conversations between action figures or with some imaginary playmate, but this... It didn't sound like that. When someone fakes a conversation with someone else, especially when it's a child, it doesn't take long to see it's them pretending. When someone fakes a conversation with someone else, especially when it's a child, it doesn't take long to see it's them pretending. Sometimes it's super obvious. They do voices for both sides, for example, but even if they only do their own part, you can tell they aren't really reacting to someone else. Everything they say is expected, following by the path that they're laying out in their own imagination, often with brief pauses as they think of the next bit as they go. There's a kind of bland joy in their voices, but it's paired with a degree of lonely dissatisfaction, like celebrating your birthday when you're all alone. You're tricking yourself into believing the conceit and being happy, and it only half works. But Aaron's conversation was different. I could hear happiness in her voice, but something else too. Frustration, maybe. Even anxiety. And it all sounded real enough that my heart sped up as I opened the door, a darker corner of my brain already picturing scenarios where some intruder has snuck into the little girl's room. Aaron turned and gave me a gap-toothed grin. Hey, Betty. I looked past her to the far side of the bed. Space there was empty. (laughs) Hey, Shortstack. Who are you talking to? Her smile fell away as her eyes followed mine to the carpet between the window and the bed. Just playing. I nodded, stepping to the window. It was shut and locked, and there was nowhere else for anything to be other than... I swallowed. I know it's early, but I'm going to go ahead and do a monster check, okay? Aaron smiled a little. Okay. I held her gaze for a second. She didn't seem scared, but she didn't seem quite right either. More like she was preoccupied or... No, I was making this into more than it was. I just needed to get over it. Crouching down quickly, I looked under the bed, terrified that I'd find a man lying under there staring back at me. But no. 
It was empty too, aside from a couple of books and a stuffed dog. Glancing back at Aaron, I forced a smile. All clear. Standing up, I held out my hand. Want to come down and watch TV? My pizza will be here in a bit and you can have some. The little girl beamed and nodded before giving me a frown. Did you get pineapple on it again? I snickered. <laughs> Only on half. I kept some pristine for the little princess. Giggling, she did a curtsy before taking my hand. See? She's totally fine. Preppier than normal, even. You're freaking out over nothing. Nodding to myself, I took her downstairs and we started watching some movie that was a bit scary, but didn't seem to bother her too much. The pizza came, we ate some, and I was coming back from getting us more drinks in the kitchen when I saw she wasn't in the living room anymore. Aaron, where'd you go, honey? My first thought was the bathroom, and after sitting down the drinks, I headed that way, but no sign of her in the downstairs bathroom. Maybe she'd gone to the kitchen the other way and I'd missed her. Nothing there, either. And no sign she'd returned to the living room when I completed my circuit of the downstairs. I headed up to the second floor, then, my heart hammering in time with my hurried steps. I was still calling out for her, less now to get her attention and more to warn her not to hide from me as I was starting to think this was part of some prank or impromptu game she was playing. She wasn't back in her room or her parents and I didn't find her anywhere else up there either. I was heading back downstairs, already planning a more thorough search of every room and closet until I found her. When I realized that the front door was now standing wide open. Stomach twisting, I stepped out onto the front porch and looked around. No sign of her out there either. And I was starting to run out of... No, wait. Down at the very end of the street, I saw a dim glimpse of movement at the edge of the street light glow. It was too quick and far away to say for sure it was her, but I needed to check and see. Closing the door behind me, I sprinted off in that direction, calling out to Aaron to stop if that was her. The corner was over a hundred yards away, and by the time I made the turn, I could see the figure even farther ahead, despite the fact that they weren't running like I was. It had to be her, didn't it? It was hard to say in the dark, and I had no idea why Aaron would run off like that, but what were the odds that another person, roughly her size, would be roaming around in the street in the dark right when she goes missing? Gritting my teeth, I forced myself to run harder. I needed to catch up before I lost her. This went on for three more blocks. Every time I thought I was gaining, I'd turn the corner and I'd find her farther ahead. I knew by then that it was definitely Aaron, but she never stopped or responded to my yelling between panting breaths. We're at the edge of the park now, and I felt a moment of panic as I realized I'd lost her again. There were too many trees and obstructions there between bathrooms and benches and playground equipment, and all of it was giving extra weight and dimension to the lengthening shadows of the night. I just needed to... You need help, little lady? I let out a startled scream as I looked around to find a man staring at me. He looked to be in his early thirties. He was wearing clothes like he'd just come from a gym. He was smiling, but there was something in his eyes I didn't like. Taking a step back, I shook my head. No, I... Did you see a little girl come this way? He chuckled. Only girl I've seen is you. You don't look that young. Not too young, anyway. The man extended his hand. Name's Keith. Can I help somehow? He glanced at his hand, then looked around again. No thanks. I... I'm just babysitting this little girl, and she ran out trying to track her down. I glanced back at him. Just... If you see a little girl by herself, yell, okay? I turned away and started jogging further into the park without waiting for a response. Five minutes later, and a new level of panic started setting in. 
I hadn't found her again, and I realized now I'd left my phone back in the living room. I didn't want to risk leaving the park to go get it, but I was quickly running out of places to look. I was trying to justify another pass through before running to the house when I heard laughter in the distance. That was Aaron laughing. Muttering a prayer under my breath, I started running in the direction of the sound. I was toward the center of the park, somewhere around the big fountain there. I'd been by before, but maybe she'd been hiding or she'd just gotten there, but... My thoughts died as I reached the plaza and stared up at the fountain. It was a massive thing of carved stone, riddled with intricately carved animals and trees winding this way and that between three shrinking levels of elevated pools that followed down into a large ground pool where people would throw coins for wishing. And at the top level, some 30 feet in the air. Aaron sat perched on the back of a carved bear. Aaron? Stay still, honey. What are you doing up there? The little girl waved at me happily, but didn't answer. I wanted to tell her to come down, but how could I? She might break her neck, and... Anyway. How'd you get up there? She swung her feet like she was spurring the stone bear forward. My friend put me up here. It can climb so good. Her eyes widened excitedly. Want me to have it bring you up here too? I frowned at her, my mind racing. What was she talking about? Had there been someone in her room? Had they abducted her? Why the hell had I left my phone behind? I glanced around but didn't see anyone. Honey, who's... No, where's your friend? I don't see them. Did they leave? Please let them have left. I could figure out a way to get her down. Just please let them have... No! They're right there. She pointed to the bottom of the pool, which was filled with shadows but looked empty. I don't see anything there, Aaron. She giggled again. That's okay. It sees you. It's looking right at you. I felt a chill go up my spine. She kept saying it, not he or she. It had to be some weird imaginary friend, but then how did she get all the way up there? And what if there was something in the dark that I just couldn't... Hey, so you found her. I jumped and turned to see the guy, Keith, standing a few feet away again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. He was staring up at Aaron now, his expression unreadable. Huh. How'd she get all the way up there? I felt my heart starting to beat faster. Had he done this somehow? I looked back up at Aaron. Honey, do you know this man? She shook her head with a frown. No? Is he your friend? Beside me, the man chuckled. <laughs> I didn't mess with your kid, honest. Just trying to be helpful. If you want me to, I'll go. I blushed and shook my head. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I'm just... Just kind of freaked out at the moment. I need to get her down without breaking something. Keith nodded. <laughs> I see what you mean. Lots of places to slip and fall. Look, why don't you call the cops or the fire department? They can get her down, right? I felt my heart sink lower. I... I left my phone at the house. My thought occurred to me as I looked away from Aaron and back at him. Do you think you could call 911 and... He stepped closer now and his friendly expression had hardened into something hungry and cruel. I was hoping you'd say that. I took a step back, but he was quicker, reaching out and grabbing my forearm to pull me toward him, even as he wrapped his other arm around me. I yelled, but then his hand was at my throat, his hot breath in my ear as he began to stagger walk me back toward the tall bushes at the edge of the fountain plaza. 
Keep quiet, bitch. If you give me what I want, I might not have to fuck you up too bad. I might have to pull that kid down. I shot an elbow in his stomach, and for a moment, his grip loosened, but then he was punching me in the side of the head once, twice, a third time, my vision blurring for a moment as he started dragging me again. I wanted to tell Aaron to get away, to go run or hide or get help, but it was all too late. Maybe if I just went along with him, he'd leave her alone and... A deep scream split the night air. My eyes instinctively turned toward the sound, and I managed to focus enough to see the water in the bottom of the fountain churning as something unseen pushed through it. Great splashes of water were flung out onto the cobblestone of the plaza as something silently charged us, ripping the man away from me so harshly that I tumbled to the ground. Now the man was screaming, squealing shrilly as his feet danced in the air, suspended by something invisible that began to break his arms over and over like it was folding up a used drinking straw. The screams became thinner, then Keith's workout shirt ripping as something wrapped around his chest and began to squeeze. New muffled popping sounds came from his chest with each undulation of pressure. I stared at all this with a combination of mute horror, satisfaction, and relief, but it wasn't until it started eating him that the unreality of it all broke through my shock for me to begin crawling away in terror. Huge bloody chunks would suddenly be gone, though somehow nothing made it all the way to the ground. Whatever it was that had him, it was exceedingly efficient in having its meal. And by the time I'd crawled back to the fountain, it was as though the man had never been there at all. I looked up at Aaron, keeping my voice low. Is... Is that your friend? She looked down over the ear of the bear and nodded. Yeah, and he's your friend now too. The little girl looked past me. Hey, get me back down, please. I did what you wanted. We need to go home and finish our pizza. I felt the air shift near me as something passed by, I heard the quiet slosh of the water as it went back into the fountain, and pulled Aaron from the bear. I wanted to protest, to ask it to stop, but I was terrified, and honestly, it hadn't done anything to the little girl yet, at least that I knew of. So instead... I sat shuddering as I watched her seemingly float through the air before being placed gently down at my side, and when she offered me her hand, I took it and stood up. Are you sure you're safe with it, Aaron? She nodded. Yeah, we are. It's been my friend for a long time, and it looks after me. But it gets hungry sometimes, and it's hard for me to find it something that's okay for it to eat. I swallowed. We were walking back toward the house now, and it took everything I had to not scoop her up and break into a run. The image of some invisible thing pulling me back and tearing me apart was honestly the main thing that stopped me. Eat? Like... people? Aaron shrugged. Yeah, mainly, I guess. I know that sounds mean, but it only gets bad people, I think. It was kind of young, too, when it first found me, but it's a lot bigger now. It told me it needs to have a grown-up to protect it so it can eat enough. She giggled and looked past me. <laughs> I told you you're being silly. I know you still love me, too. I'm not mad about it. I super swear. The girl rolled her eyes at me. I get so sensitive about stuff, but I understand. And I wanted to be happy. She gave my hand a squeeze. That's why I picked you. I slowed down. Picked me how? She grinned. It's going to protect you now. I don't know if you'll ever be able to see it or hear it, but it says that's okay. It'll be happy just so long as it can eat some and keep you safe. She laughed and nodded past me. And visit me sometimes, too. Blinking, I stopped in the middle of the street and stared down at her. 
Aaron. I don't want that. I... I mean, I guess I believe you after everything, but I don't want some invisible... friend just hanging around me all the time and occasionally eating people it thinks is bad. Aaron was already shaking her head. No, it won't be like that. I mean, the hanging around part, yeah, but you can decide who it eats, so long as it gets to eat every few months. It just gets sad if it's too hungry. She shrugged again, her voice softer as her gaze drifted into the dark asphalt. Besides, being around isn't something you pick. It picks you. That was... Ten years ago. Since then, I've been pretty lucky. I have a great contract job, plenty of friends, and while back in high school and freshman year of college, I was kind of overweight and sickly, I haven't had so much as a cold in the last decade. And people are always asking me what diet or exercise routine I used to stay in such good shape. I don't tell anyone about my special friend's blessings, but I'm honest about the rest. I eat what I want. I do run a lot. I mainly run late at night, through parks, rough neighborhoods, areas I read about in the newspaper. Over time, I've had to drive out farther for some of my midnight runs, but the change of scenery is actually quite nice, even if it's running past an abandoned factory or a trap house. And honestly, this whole experience has made me feel better about humans as a race. Do you know how hard it is to find someone that will attack you? It probably feels like you could turn down any dark street and find death, but really, most people don't want to do more than be left alone or, at worst, talk a little shit as you jog by. Sometimes it takes weeks just to find someone that will cross the line between douchebag and dinner. Still, I must be doing a pretty good job of keeping our friend well fed. Every time we visit Aaron, she tells me everything it's saying and about how happy it is and how much it loves us. And despite being taller than me now, when Aaron hugs it, her hands can't even reach all the way around the air she's squeezing. Funny enough, the shared bond with our guardian has also brought the two of us closer together. She's two years away from college, but she's already hinting around at going somewhere near where I move after my current work contract is done. And to be fair, I'd like her to be close too. I think we both would. That's when I look at cities for the next stage of my career. I cross-check them against several different things they have to have. Nice scenery not too far away? Check. Good college with a safe campus? Check. Selection of cool restaurants and affordable housing? Check. All that and good running paths through areas with a high instance of violence crime? Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. I liked Ben. I really did. I mean, he was a nice guy. We had some fun times together in college, messing around the dorm, going to parties, all the dumb shit that college guys do. He was cool and all, but he was a little... pretentious. Well, I guess the word he used was artistic. He thought he was real smart, spent a lot of time trying to prove it to everyone. He had his own blog developed to film critiques. Not the big ones, though. Just little indie productions because nothing else was worth his time. When he got like that, he could be pretty insufferable. Perhaps the most annoying thing he did was performance art. Now, I don't want to be the guy who says that all performance art is dumb, but... Yeah, no, all performance art is dumb. Oh look, you're on a display painting a picture of Jesus from your own urine. How original and edgy. Maybe I'm a little jaded, but it always seemed so contrived to me. Fortunately, Ben really loved it. He thought there was something beautiful in art that was physically living, and he devoted an embarrassing amount of time to it. Anyway... I hung out with Ben a few times after college, but we mostly just met up to do some heavy drinking and maybe hit a strip club or two. He considered that performance art as well, which was 
just fine with me. Gave me an excuse to waste some ones. Since we didn't hang out very often, I had a bad feeling when he contacted me about a month before last Halloween. He called me up at about 7 in the morning on a Saturday, which is too early to even consider waking up in my opinion. I answered in a daze, and he started running his mouth like crazy, as though afraid that if he didn't get it all out at once, he never would. Mikey, hey, Mike, listen, buddy, I need your help, okay? Okay, okay, I've got this idea for a performance, and, well, it's gonna be killer, you know? So good. It's going down on Halloween. Can you come help? Look, I'll even pay you, man. Fifty bucks. How about it? No. I've never cared much for Halloween one way or the other, and I'm a pretty easy guy. Fifty dollars to probably just sit around and run a fog machine or some bullshit? Sign me up. For the right price, I could even pretend that I wanted to be there. Besides, what else are friends for? A few days later, he gave me the details. To be honest, I was a little shocked when he sent me the email. I know that performance art is intended to be edgy and can sometimes get a little dangerous, but this seemed like downright neglect. Thanks for agreeing to do this for me. I've talked to a few other people where they weren't really comfortable with it for reasons you'll probably be able to figure out. Of course, I understand if you want to back out, but I think you're probably the most reliable person I know. It's really not that big of a deal, I'm sure you'll agree. As I'm sure you've noticed, vampires have become very prominent in the media as of late. I say vampires because they are beginning to deviate so wildly from the traditional myths that they resemble forest fairies more than anything else. Altruistic? Sparkly? Whiny? (laughs) Give me a break. We need more Dracula. We need more Carmilla. We need more death, destruction, and blood. My performance will center on the theme of rebirthing the vampire. For the vampire to be reborn, he must first be buried. To turn people's attention back to the myths of old, I will be doing just that. I will be burying the vampire. I have a group of viewers signed up already to participate in the performance, so you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to plant a series of vampire-themed clues around town for them to follow. The clues should be pretty simple, and it will probably take no more than an hour or an hour and a half for them to find me. Here comes the... somewhat... controversial part. Essentially, for this performance to have any semblance of meaning, I need to be buried alive. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. I have a buddy from back home who's built me a coffin with a hole in the top. I'll be fixing it with a pipe that will stick out an inch or two above the ground. That way I won't run out of air. I also have a few necessities in the coffin in case something happens. Food, water, and a flashlight. Once they arrive at my grave, which will be completely vampirized, they will be provided with an array of shovels that will bring me back to life. A reincarnation of the true mythological history of vampires. Here's where you come in. I need you to bury me. In addition, I need you to be my safety net. If they can't find me, if something goes wrong, if I become sick, I need you to be the one to get me out or call the police, if necessary. I'll also need you to decorate my grave, make it real creepy. Don't worry, I'll send you some blueprints. I know this is a little stressful, and it may take some time for you to decide, but rest assured, this is a completely safe project. There's no danger of suffocation, and the coffin is sturdy, so it's very unlikely that I'll collapse. I really just need you there for support and the actual hard work of burying me. What do you say? I'd even be willing to pay you $100 if that's what you need. Let me know. R.I.P. Ben. I stared at my screen. For a few minutes. Completely dumbfounded. Once I cut through all the bullshit about art and vampires and rebirth, 
what it came down to was death. This guy actually wanted me to almost kill him. I mean, sure, it probably was safe, but my mind went over the plan slowly. What if I couldn't get him out in time? One shovel and a pile of dirt wouldn't be a fast job. Furthermore, what if something happened to me? Before making a decision, I sent him another email asking if he was really sure he was up for this. Of course he knew, he said. And then he said something that would always stick with me. Art must be a little dangerous, my friend, for it to be real. A month later, I found myself standing at the foot of a grave. It was six feet deep and perfectly rectangular. Sitting at the bottom was a tapered coffin covered with black lacquer, a white skull painted on the top. In the eye of the skull was a hole just big enough for the PVC pipe. Stenciled underneath was a line from Dracula. For the dead travel fast. I stood there like an idiot, waiting for Ben to show up. In the end, I decided to go along with this stupid gig, but Ben was a stubborn bastard, and if I didn't help him, someone else would. At least that's my justification. But the real reason was that Deep inside my heart, his words were still echoing. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. I ended up doing a little more work than I had intended. For one, I had to place his stupid clues around the city. It wasn't hard work, but it took some time to get them all in the proper places. Luckily for Ben, they were pretty obvious clues. There was no need to worry that his participants would be unable to find him. Ben had set up the grave in a coffin a few days prior to Halloween. It was out in the woods, just on the outskirts of town, no chance of it being disturbed. I'd tried to talk him out of burying it the whole six feet down. Something happens and I need to get you out fast, what will I do? Can't you put it closer to the surface? Ben had just shaken his head in exasperation. You just don't get it, do you? It has to be done right. Remember what I told you. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. So I shrugged and let him mess around with whatever dumbassery would get him off. I was just beginning to wonder if I should have brought more beer. This promised to be a long night when Ben finally showed up. I had to restrain my laughter when I saw us get up. A cheap Dracula costume from Walmart had never looked so pathetic, especially when topped off with those cheap plastic fangs. He greased his hair back and painted on a widow's peak. I couldn't resist. (laughs) Wow. Seriously, dude? He gave me a stern look. It's a comment on the commercialization of vampires and horror as we know it today. He fished around in his pocket and pulled out a walkie-talkie. Here, take one. The range isn't very far, but my phone won't work that far underground. You'll have to stay nearby. Let me know if you're going out of range. I shrugged and took it. Okay, but you brought your cell just in case, right? What good will it do if it doesn't work? This guy's batshit insane, I thought. But he handed me the hundred dollars and suddenly it didn't seem to matter anymore. I held him into the coffin and shut the lid. He seemed pretty calm. If it were me, I knew I'd be having a panic attack. I fit the PVC pipe into the hole. It slid in perfectly snug. I climbed out the coffin and grabbed my shovel, taking one last look at the shiny black peeking out from the dirt. With a resigned shrug, I started to shovel in the dirt. Okay, well, he asked for this, I thought. It took almost a full hour to get the dirt piled in. The PVC pipe was just barely visible over the grave. I piled the earth around it to hide it as well as I could. Then I set up the rest of the grave, a hideously gothic headstone made of styrofoam and cheap Walmart flowers. 
Once it was finally finished, I sat back against a tree and waited. There was an awful lot of waiting to be done. Three hours later, his participants still hadn't come. He'd buzzed in on the walkie-talkie a few times, asking me if they'd shown up. I continually answered in the negative, wondering how long he'd be willing to keep up this charade. He must be getting worried, I thought, staring at my watch. It was already 10 p.m. and not a soul to be seen. Hey, Mike, something must have happened. I, I don't think they're coming. Can you get me out of here? Ben's voice crackled and faded in and out of the static fuzz. I took another swig of my beer and heaved a sigh. Of course they weren't coming. They were frantically searching for the last clue. My hand crept into my pocket as I felt it folded there, the creases poking at the soft flesh in my palm. Mike? Are you there? Did you go out of range? I turned the walkie-talkie off. I didn't need it anymore anyway. Carefully, I picked up a handful of disturbed earth from the top of the makeshift grave. I poured it down the pipe and listened. I heard the muffled exclamation, the series of expletives. I thought I could hear a thumping sound. It must be hitting the top of the coffin. I smiled a little to myself as I poured more dirt through the pipe. Ben's struggles got louder and louder, and I felt a certain heat rising up in me. I knew it could be good, but I didn't know it could be this good. This was incredible. This was perfect. This was godly. Eventually, I grew bored of shoving earth down into the coffin. I could hear Ben screaming and sobbing, reverberating up the pipe. I yanked a handkerchief out of my back pocket and stuffed it inside. I made sure to plug it up good and tight. It would only be a matter of time now. Assuming he could regulate his breathing, he could possibly have a few hours, but I knew he was panicking. And that would simply serve to shorten his time. The pounding grew weaker as I finished my beer. Once I was certain there was no saving him, I went to finish my work. Ben was right. Everything really did go off without a hitch. I don't know what it was I was so worried about. I'd gone to find his lost sheep, the wayward participants who were scrambling in frustration for the last clue. I scolded them for making us wait so long, acted the part of the reluctant friend indulging his lunatic companion. I took them out to the grave. It was now past midnight. They sat hushed as I gave the stupid speech that Ben had prepared for me. Everything seemed normal. I made sure to stow away the rag before anyone could see it. Friends, foes, and everyone in between. Tonight we gather to resurrect the ancient horror that has plagued mankind for centuries. Its tale, once a gruesome epic of blood and seduction, has become nothing more than the commercialized fodder as society has aged. Now the time has come for the phoenix to burn and rise again. So too shall the blood-soaked visage of the vampire... My voice resonated through the woods, and the morons in attendance clapped as they all reached for their shovels. We dug them up in about half an hour. It was much faster work with this host of suckers. It was good that we reached the coffin quickly, because I could barely contain my excitement. Two of the men opened the coffin and screamed. The woman leaned in over the grave to peek as well, full of expectancy. There was something... Dreadful about the scene, to be sure. Ben's face had gone gray, sprayed over with a few specks of dirt. His hands were bloody, his fingernails pried off. Deep scratches decorated the top of the lid. The men who had opened his tomb dragged him out in a panic, unsure if this was part of the performance or not. A few moments of silence, listening at his chest produced no heartbeat. The proclamation was definitive. He was dead. They screamed, 
They called the police. They alternatively looked at his body and shielded themselves from his horror, enraptured yet struggling. They ignored me. But that was fine. It was fine because they were admiring my work, the work of a real artist. Finally, I had been given this opportunity to prove my worth. Finally, I had found my sacrificial lamb. And it had been a rousing success. The heat raging in my body affirmed that much. I didn't even care if I was caught so long as I could have this moment to hold for the rest of my life. Ben was right, and I should have known. A man of principle never lies, and I owe him a debt of gratitude for realizing the artist within me. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. <laughs>